hear a baby. Yeah, we'll just mute everybody. I, I mute. I better mute. This is G. Okay. Good evening, everyone. We are slowly. Uh, Matthew's letting people in. The time is 5.31. Matthew, should I hold off a few minutes? Do you have quite a few people still coming in? Uh, everyone that was in the waiting room is currently in, so you should be good to go. Okay, great. It is 5.31 p.m. Uh, we are going to start uh, our February 3rd City of Livingston Planning Board meeting. Thank you, everybody, for showing up tonight. Um, we are going to start the meeting with roll call and approval of minutes, and I won't forget that part tonight. So let's start with roll call. Taya? Present. Tori? Present. Shannon? Present. Stacy? Present. Brian? Here. And this is Jesse, I'm here. And then Melissa is not joining us this evening. And then we also have uh, Deputy City Planner Matthew Menard on the call as well. Oh, the water's running. Oop, and if you haven't turned your microphone onto mute, could you do that for us, please? Sorry. There's a couple people who still have it on. Okay, great. Okay, we need to go through the approval of last meeting's minutes. So that would be the January 20th meeting. Could I get a motion to approve those minutes? Ms. Bryan, I make a motion to approve. Okay. I'll second. Shannon, second. Shannon seconds. All in favor, we'll go through. Taya? Aye. Tori? Aye. Shannon? Four. Stacy? Four. Brian? Four. And Jesse, I'm four. Okay. We've approved last meeting minutes. Okay, we're gonna move into public comment. This is our first open public comment. And so please make a comment on uh, items that the planning board has jurisdiction over. And this is the time for general comments on the growth policy, but not specific comments on any of the agenda items. So the agenda items include this evening, the ETJ extraterritorial jurisdiction of the growth plan, growth policy review chapter one, the introduction and growth policy review chapter two, population and community, community character. If you have comments on those sections, please hold them until we get to that area of the agenda. The first public comment is just general comments um, on items that the, the planning board has jurisdiction on, but not the agenda items. So I'm gonna ask you, we'll open up public comment. Please state your full name, your physical address, and if it's possible, please for our minute taker, mention the focus of your comment if possible. Okay, let's go ahead and open it up to public comment. You have three minutes to comment because we're following the city commission um, public comment time period. And so, Matthew, do you have the timer today? Okay, perfect. So we'll go ahead. If you want to make a comment, you can raise your hand or enter your name in the chat. And I see Jennifer Magic has her hand raised. Jennifer, would you like to make a comment? Yeah, thanks, Jesse. And good evening, everyone. My comments are going to be real brief. Um, I just wanted to applaud all of you. Um, I've just been really impressed and uh, much is due to the board, but also uh, to Matthew Menard's good work. Um, you guys uh, have just moved light years in terms of organization and just how your meetings are structured and your professionalism. So. That's all I have to say. Congratulations, you're doing great work. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay. Um, I saw somebody else was a hammered up, but now that the timer's there, I don't see it. Um, 
Would anyone else like to make a public comment? Jesse, can I, I'm gonna, can I make a quick comment? This is Michelle. Yep, go ahead, Michelle. Okay. Um, and I, I, you know, of course, wanna thank the planning board for taking so much time to consider the growth policy. Uh, it seems like a full-time job to go through all this information and all the comments received. Uh, I want you to know we really great, we appreciate that. And then, you know, I work with the Park County Environmental Council and we've decided to invest quite heavily in the growth policy process. This is because more than 2,600 supporters have said they care about the future of the community and they know there's a lot at stake. And so, well, I think you've heard from a lot of people and what you've heard is, you know, folks don't want sprawl. They wanna prioritize infill development and growth in the city. Um, and especially over the next five years that, that this is what the document is supposed to cover. Um, so my question, I, you know, we've seen the updated map and updated language in the draft policy and that's a great start. Um, it's clear that you're listening, but what I really hope is that you can reiterate that to the community and to the public so that they um, see how you're incorporating comments through the process and to make that part more transparent for folks. Um, and I apologize for the loud screaming baby in the background. And I look forward to uh, turning my video on and uh, joining you all in this process. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michelle. It looks like uh, Daniela Love, you have a comment? Oh, here's yes, a person. Just... Go ahead, Danielle. I just want to second everything Michelle said. <laughs> Don't forget name and address, please. Oh, oh Daniela um, at 705 Lock Laven Drive in Livingston. And I just want to second the appreciation to all the work that y'all are doing and also second strongly on everything Michelle um, said. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Daniela. Would anyone else like to make public comment? Okay, this is the second call for public comment. Last call for public comment. Okay, public comment is closed. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to old business, which we don't have anything on our agenda for old business. So we'll move into new business. Um, first, we're going to go ahead and start with the first item on our agenda, which is the extraterritorial jurisdiction plan. So, Matthew, thank you so much for putting together the memo. Uh, thank you for including some additional maps. Thank you for also including all the public comment that you have received with uh, indication to where and how that public comment was inserted into the new draft. So if you have made public comment in the past and you were concerned that you haven't been heard or you're concerned that your public comment didn't make it into the draft, please review those. I know it's rather lengthy. I think we've got a 175 page memo attached to this agenda today, but that will help you understand or find your comment that you may have made in the past and see where it has been uh, or not been and why inserted into the growth policy draft. If you have questions about that, you can absolutely email Matthew at the planning board um, and, and he can help direct you or answer more questions around uh, your specific comment. Uh, so thanks for including those, Matthew. I think those will be really helpful for people as far as the transparency piece and being heard. Okay, so um, Matthew, would you like to give an intro to the topic and the, the changes that you've already made to the ETGJ, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just a brief introduction for those of whom this is their first meeting. Uh, we're talking about the extraterritorial jurisdiction in chapters one and two today. Um, so I'm hoping we can really stick to those topics just to uh, allow the planning board to move through uh, the chapters that they are scheduled to move through. Uh, so I'm going to make this pretty quick. Um, so the proposed updates uh, from last meeting and what I've heard from public comment, and I'm just going to list these off quickly here. Um, the page numbering has been updated to read ETJ, uh, page number basically, and then the page number. And I should say, I, we got the draft uh, from the draft changes from last meeting back about an hour ago. Uh, so I haven't really gotten a chance to look through those, um, but we will get those out to you shortly. 
Um, an incorrect figure reference has been corrected on page four. It said 1.1 instead of 2.1. Uh, the ECJ map, uh, the gray cloud has been updated to just an outline. Um, the area space and development pressure map has been updated to the combined map that we talked about at the last meeting. So it shows an recent annexations and um, area space and development pressure. Uh, I am getting some background noise. So if everyone could please mute their microphones, that would be helpful. Um, the area of the existing Bozeman Trail, connector trail parallel to Fleshman Creek, um, basically near Jack Weimar Memorial Park, uh, where the tr current trail is, has been changed to uh, parks and open space on the ETJ feature land use map. Uh, the area between Galton Street and Maple Street along Miles Lane has been changed to mixed use on the ETJ future land use map. Uh, the word prioritize has been added to the beginning of strategy 3.1.2, which was a public comment we got. Uh, and the abbreviations have all been updated, so it's actually consistent when we use the abbreviations. Um, additional changes discussed. Uh, we discussed these all at the last meeting, so I'm not going to go over them again. They were included in the memo. Uh, I'm not going to go over Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 right now since we're talking about the ETJ. Um, if you don't mind, I will go over those. Uh, when we get to those sections, they're much shorter than the ETJ. Now, just a brief discussion of some general public comments we've been hearing. Uh, we have had a significant number of comments uh, really asking for the growth policy to focus on infill as has been mentioned already in public comment. Um, I do think at this time that the growth policy very much does that and prioritizes infill and uses very strong uh, language. We'll discuss that more at the next meeting, which discusses is chapter, we will discuss chapter three, which is the land use section of the um, growth policy. Uh, there has also been a significant amount of public comment requesting a short summary of the growth policy. Uh, we are planning to put together an executive summary. Uh, we do need to wait till all the changes are at least completed or towards the end of the planning board's uh, review process to do that. So hang tight on that one. Uh, we will get to it. Uh, and there's been quite a few comments regarding the large section of uh, area shown as manufacturing on the future land use map uh, in the ETJ, uh, requesting that this have a, a different name. There are existing gravel pits in the area, uh, and it's, it's definitely worthwhile for the planning board to have a discussion on uh, whether you all think that name should be changed to something that is more uh, appropriate or indicative of the actual use of the land. Uh, a couple of points of clarity that I heard at the last meeting. Um, there does appear to be some concern that specific areas within the ETJ or the ETJ will be annexed into the city. Uh, this is not the case or the intention. Um, ex the extraterritorial jurisdiction means it only applies to areas outside of city limits. Uh, so when land does get annexed, it will, this portion of the growth policy will no longer apply. It will be within the city and the main growth policy will apply to it. Uh, the reason we're showing a two mile border around the city uh, is that is what state law currently gives us the authority to, to zone and regulate. Uh, the city has generally not required properties to annex into the city unless they're on city services. This, the growth policy doesn't recommend that that policy changes uh, and I wouldn't expect it to change. Uh, the only time we really do annexations are if uh, there are parcels on city services already or the property owners themselves request to connect to those city services. Uh, they are generally annexed at that time. Um, there's been significant amount of public comment that the future land use map encourages or allows the entire extraterritorial jurisdiction to be subdivided into sort of suburban style or larger lot uh, residential subdivisions. Um, I think this is because the low density land use definition covers a density of zero to two dwelling units per acre. Uh, it is a broad brush designation and it's meant to provide a range of uses, uh, which would be implemented through regulatory action, in this case zoning. Uh, so when we go to zone that that exact density would be negotiated at that time. Uh, I do want to make it very clear that the growth policy is not a regulatory document and is only providing recommendations. So the growth policy cannot set a density for the extraterritorial jurisdiction that would have to be done through zoning. Uh, I do think again that the language is very strong in the actual goals, specifically goal three of the extraterritorial jurisdiction, making it very clear that we don't want to see the extraterritorial jurisdiction subdivided at all. Um, specifically, there's a goal that reads uh, require annexation prior to subdivision of any parcel in the extraterritorial jurisdiction. Um, so what 
the growth policy is not looking to do is subdivide the entire area into to one or two acre parcels. Um, you'll note that I say that, and then there's many goals in the extraterritorial jurisdiction section that discuss new development, uh, which may, may sound contradictory, um, but because it's a non-regulatory document, it doesn't it can't say no new development and that be the end all be all. So we do need to discuss new development uh, because if it does happen, we want to have some guidance on how it does happen. Uh, there is one more paragraph in the memo that discusses data. And uh, I will talk about that when we get to chapter one um, where it's gonna be a more um, pressing issue. And that's uh, all I have. If you have any questions, I'm uh, happy to answer those or we can uh, move on to public comment. Okay. Oh, thank you so much, Matthew. Go ahead. Um, we can open it up to board discussion and questions right now. Go ahead, So, Taya, did you have something to? I did. Um, first of all, Matthew, thank you so much for the maps, um, the additional maps. That was super helpful, and I think big picture wise really helps um, helps us. And also, I really appreciate the updating of the strategies in the ETJ chapter, um, specifically three point one point nine, maintain existing agricultural uses within the ETJ. I think you captured public comment there. Um, one thing I noticed uh, with the we touched on it last week or two weeks ago with the combining of the agriculture and low density residential. Based on public, public comment, I do agree. I think it muddies the waters a bit. Um, and I was thinking about our conversation regarding the manufacturing area and you had indicated it was designated as such or in the recommended as such because that's what was already there. And so I was thinking, can we apply the same rule of thumb to agriculture. So whatever is existing agriculture, whether it's farmland or grazing, we recommend that it remains ag in that map. Uh, we can definitely discuss that and let's discuss that um, during board discussion after public comment, just so we take all the public comment into account as well in that discussion. Thank you. Okay, anybody else on the board have a question for Matthew? Okay. So we're oh, not we aren't making sorry. comments. Sorry, this is Tori. We're not making comments about the ETJ section right now, are we? It sounds like we're just getting clarifying com uh, questions from Matthew on the intro, and then we'll open it up for uh, public comment, and then we'll make then we'll discuss. So this is just any questions you might have uh, for Matthew based on his intro. Okay, are you good? I'm good, thank okay. you. Okay, hearing none, we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment. Um, please remember you have three minutes. We appreciate all your comments uh, and we are only focusing on the ETA ETJ for this public comment section. We will allow for public comment on chapter one and chapter two later on in the meeting. Okay, Stacy, are you ready? Yes. Okay, we will go ahead and open it up to public comment. If you have a public comment, please raise your hand. I don't see any hands raised. Oh, I'm sorry, there they are. <laughs> Jean Keffler, do you have a comment? I do, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the planning board. Um, my name is Jean Keffler. I am a co-founder of Friends of Park County. I Jean, live don't forget your address. I'm sorry to interrupt. Name oh, and address, you please. You bet. I live my, at 1010 Swingley Road, Livingston, Montana. Um, our, my co-chairs, Frank Schroeder and Ken Cochran, will also be testifying tonight. Um, and all of us will be talking about the desire to maintain a very clear distinction between the city and the countryside outside the city limits. The Rocky Mountain West is peppered with wonderful towns that have been engulfed and their character suffocated 
by surrounding sprawl. This need not happen to Livingston. It is not inevitable and it is not too late. Other cities the size of Livingston, or for that matter, Bozeman, have collaborated with their surrounding counties to adopt effective plans in zoning, plans that strengthen cities by focusing growth into compact and contiguous neighborhoods, and at the same time, protect the farmland, the agricultural economy, and the natural resources outside the city. We have provided you with three examples. The city of Frankenmuth, Michigan. The city of Winters in California's Sacramento River Valley. And the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. The success of these cities is visible in the satellite photos we shared in our written testimony. And these are but three examples. If you would like to know more about these places and what they have done, please join us for the Friends of Park County's online educational program this coming Monday evening at five, Rural Sprawl, what it is and how to prevent it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your public service. Thank you very much, Jean. Um, next, Mr. Schroeder, would you like to give public comment? Please state your name and your address, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Frank Schroeder. I live at 477 Mill Creek Road in Prey, and I am chairman of the board of Friends of Park County and a co-founder. Friends of Park County's recommendation to you today are based on a simple proposition. There is a city, Livingston, inside the city limits, and outside the city limits is the country, the magnificent Montana landscape. This clear distinction is what we see every time we come into Livingston from any direction. In our view, that distinction should be maintained and reinforced as the basic organization, organizing principle for the policies in the extraterritorial uh, jurisdiction, the ETJ. So thinking of an apt and perhaps exaggerated Western analogy for this distinction, there are two of God's creatures, the jackrabbit and the antelope. Separately, each is a wonderful animal, but blend them and we have the infamous and elusive jackalope. So exaggerating to make a point and to maybe reinforce what Matthew said earlier, that's what's going to happen if the land use designations in your growth policy recommend that the ETJ be developed with thousands of half acre and one acre home sites, a 3000 acre industrial park, and the continuation of strip commercial sprawl along 89 South. Because Livingston, no matter how charming it is inside the city limits, will not be the same place if it is submerged in a belt of disorganizational sprawl. That sprawl will replace farming and ranching and wildlife with houses just as it has in the Gallatin County. That sprawl could risk polluting our groundwater and our fishing streams with human sewage because that's exactly what has happened in Teton County, Wyoming, which is the home of Jackson. Sprawl may deplete groundwater. As a consequence, city taxpayers may be asked to fund the extension of water and sewer services to remedy these problems. A belt of sprawl will make the orderly and compact growth of Livingston difficult at best because one cannot retrofit traditional neighborhoods into a swath of one acre home sites. Montana's planning laws do give you authority and the discretion to do the right thing. Focus growth inside the city limits and keep the lands outside the city limits as country. Thanks very much and thank you for your public service. Thank you very much. Um, I see Kenneth Cochran, would you like to state your name, address and give your public comment, please? Uh, yes, uh, my name is Kenneth Cochran. I am a co-founder and board member of Friends of Park County. My address is 60 Majestic Ridge Trail, Livingston. Your staff has reminded you of four things about your growth policy. 
It's a plan for future growth. It consists only of policy recommendations for future land uses. It does not have the authority to regulate land uses. It employs land use designations, which are broad brush descriptions of recommended future land uses. They are not as specific as zoning. The regulation of land comes later in the form of zoning, which is based upon the broad brush land use designations. Okay, that all makes sense as a description of the planning process in Montana. What doesn't make sense is that these planning procedures somehow require you to adopt broad brush land use that recommend the future land use, thousands of acres of one half and one acre home sites, thousands of acres of industrial uses, and the continuation of strip commercial development along Highway 89. I say to you that the law has no such requirements. At some point, the city will need to turn those recommended future land use designations into zoning. How can the city argue that even though its growth policy has designated thousands of acres of land, for one half and one acre home sites as recommended future use, it wants to adopt zoning that prohibits that use to fulfill its redrafted goal three, very strong infill policy. And thank you, Taya, for noting these issues. How can the growth policy rely on land use designation of manufacturing, a term that isn't even included or defined in the list of land use designations. And finally, do you really want a growth policy to use a land use designation that is self-contradictory? I'm referring to agriculture, very low density regulation, re residential designation, which quote, intends to protect and enhance agriculture, end quote, by authorizing, not recommending, that the land be cut up into thousands of one half and one acre home sites. Inside the city limits is the city, outside the city limits is country. Land for the business of farming and ranching and wildlife and the natural resources and grand landscapes we are proud to call home. The illustration of potential land use designations sent to you on Friday in our written testimony shows you how this can be done. That is a growth policy that is simple, easy to understand, and provides clear directions on how to implement it. And just to PS, our educational program is Tuesday, February the 16th, not Monday, February the 8th. We changed it. Thank you for Thank your work you. on behalf of all of Park County. Thank you very much. Okay, I see uh, Spencer Lawley. Would you like to state your name and your address, please, and give your comment? Certainly. Uh, my name is Spencer Lawley. I live at 75 Willow Creek Road. Um, my comments are not nearly as polished as the folks who have gone before me, uh, but I would simply like to say or touch on a couple points that have been brought up, which is the, um, the benefit and my strong support for a strong distinction of uh, having the ETJ continue to try to um, enhance and maintain the rural and ag agrarian characteristics that it has. I grew up um, where what was referenced earlier down in Jackson, Wyoming, and then over in McCall, Idaho. And so I've seen um, places that seem to be sort of geographically or due to pre-existing land constraints, um, areas where they were a little more bounded and it, it uh, maintained much of the character and the ability for not just to look out and see the county and rural, but also for local residents to participate on the either public lands or the access to the outdoors that was much closer to town and gave them better opportunities for a healthy outdoor lifestyle. And also, um, I think it provides significant benefits to the wildlife and the ecosystems of which we're a, a bigger, you know, just a small piece of. And I think in taking that into account, uh, even within something that seems as small as the ETJ can ha have significant positive impacts for the residents and the surrounding uh, ecosystems and animals. That's all. Okay, thank you for your comment. Um, I see Michelle Uberagua, would you like to state your name, address and make your comment, please? Hi, 
You're on mute, Michelle. Hi, Jesse. It's Hello. Michelle Ubaraga at 7-Eleven Lock Laven. Um, and here I have a sleeping baby. So I will quickly give some comments on behalf of the Park County Environmental Council on the extraterritorial jurisdiction. Um, and I think that we all agree one of the most important aspects of this process is the future land use map and the extraterritorial jurisdiction. It's a vision for the future of Livingston that people are gonna to continue to refer back to. Um, so I think it's incredibly important and I'm really grateful that you have been working to incorporate what people want into that vision. Um, and like I said, we realize you've heard from a lot of people, they don't want sprawl, we want infill development. We wanna prioritize growth in the city. And then especially over the next five years, uh, as this document should cover. So the updated map and updated language is excellent. It's a great start. We'd like to learn more about what the planning board's intention is in the tan part of the map for agriculture. This is very low density, that sounds great, but in reality, it could mean lots of houses spreading out into the wildlands that surround Livingston and along the Yellowstone River. And that's a place we all deeply value. Um, so I'd like to make sure we have a clear understanding of the definition of agricultural lands. Um, it's also critically important to think about every area, whether it's the pink, the mixed use along the highway, uh, the yellow and red between Highway 89 and the river, and the purple east of town. I want to um, make it clear the community has been quite uh, pointed that folks don't want to see growth in the extraterritorial jurisdiction and that um, that's been articulated at I think every public meeting to date and the growth policy absolutely should reflect that uh, vision that the community has shared um, and this map is a vision and uh, it's perhaps the most important part of the growth policy so thank you so much for taking time to consider public comment tonight and the public comment that you've received over the past uh, year on this. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Okay, next, I see Jonathan. Would you like to say your name, address, and comment, please? Yeah, uh, Jonathan Hedinger, 519 West Park Street. Um, I'd like to echo what Michelle said. And then also, um, I just had a, a couple specific things that I kind of wanted to just ask about and um, I kind of was just wondering about the difference between natural area and open um, and kind of what that means and then um, when you're looking at um, Ninth Street Island in that area um, in the future land use uh, map 2.8 um, it's yellow north of 90 and green south of 90. Um, I think that it might merit discussing making it all green. Um, I think at the last meeting uh, we discussed, or you, you, I think that the planning board made the decision um, to not make the area near, right next to the river R3. Um, and just, and so I was thinking if you could limit new development in those areas, but I do think it's critically important to kind of uh, annex those areas just for the safety of residents and just consistency and things like that. And then, um, yeah, I just think um, just that entire corridor um, between um, the bridge where it turns from 70 into 55 all the way up to like uh, the McDonald's area. I think that entire side of the river, I think it's just, it's worth considering what types of um, restrictions or you, what, what the community wants there and kind of what that means for the health of the river. Um, so I just wanted to bring those things up and say, and then also, yeah, I think that um, the upgraded map or the new map looks great. And I really appreciate all the work that went into it. So thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Okay, Jennifer Magic, would you like to state your name, address, and your comment, please? Yes. Thank you very much, Jesse. My name is Jennifer Magic. I live at 624 South 3rd in Bozeman. I'm going to be quick. Um, I have been a land use planner um, for 15 plus years. I know the ills of sprawl. 
I know the cost of sprawl, and I really encourage the board. You've heard the testimony, and I would like to echo uh, all the testimony presented tonight and the use of the word sprawl. So I'd like to encourage the board to use that word in your growth policy. It's a word and a concept that people understand. And right now, your document does not really include that word to the greatest extent that it should be included. I urge you to include it in your introduction and certainly in chapter three. That's all I have to say. Don't be afraid to use the word sprawl in your growth policy. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. I see Jeff Reed. Would you like to state name, address, and make your comment, please, on the ETJ? Yes, thank you. Uh, Jeff Reed, I live at 2786 Highway 89 South. Uh, an immigrant where I run a farm and then I'm a landlord um, and own the Thompson building on Main Street. Um, regarding the agricultural designation on the ETG, I would just recommend if, if you do go down the path of trying to specify what's gonna happen in that particular zone, um, you know, all of us in the farming and ag industry know that you're not gonna be, you know, growing crops or running cattle on a two acre lot and I, I think it would be awesome for, you know, like Spencer, I don't have a prepared comment, so I'm speaking from the heart, but I think it would be awesome instead of ag getting infringed upon from the city, that the open spaces that agriculture can provide in instead infringes upon sprawl growth. And so if you, if you are gonna designate agriculture in that ETJ, um, maybe go back to the drawing board and go talk to actual producers and say, where would ag actually exist in this area? Where could you run cattle or livestock or a market garden or a larger crop um, to feed the city? And think of it that way in, instead of combining those two together because it's really confusing um, and designate you know, acreage allotments. Uh, instead of making two acres kind of this boundary zone, why not get really creative and go certain sections can have minimum 100 acres. If, if there's no statute tied to this, then be creative. And if you're going to define agriculture, uh, think of it like a producer would. So thank you, uh, like everybody else said, for all that you're doing. Great. Thank you very much. Um, um uh, Jesse, yes. I didn't. I didn't catch his um, address. It was twenty-seven eighty-six. What? Highway eighty-nine South. Oh, twenty-seven eighty-six Highway eighty-nine South. Yeah. Okay. It's, Thank you. Yeah, it's fun putting that on your postage. Yeah, <laughs> I imagine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I am not seeing. Any other hands raised? I, okay, last call from for public comment. And if you are unable to raise your hand and I can't see it, uh, please go ahead and speak, unmute. Jesse, we do have one uh, hand that just went up from Tim Stevens. Oh, great, thank you. Tim Stevens, uh, name, address, and your comment, please. Hey, Jesse, thanks a lot. Uh, Tim Stevens, 315 North 3rd Street here in Livingston. And um, I, again, I, uh, like others have, really applaud you with this process. And um, I'm a little rusty on it, but I do appreciate um, the rigor with which you're engaging the public and really listening. And um, like others, I don't have any uh, detailed comments prepared, although I will say that the the ETJ was once known as the donut back in the day. So um, <laughs> that's the odd thing of it. But I, I think, you know, I, I think that I would echo um, what Frank Schroeder had to say about the specifics of, of uh, the seeming conflict between how you're defining this land. Um, I, I think I would also echo the notion of, um, you know, this country chopped up into uh, two acre lots with the prospect for a lot of homes. And I guess I would, I would urge you, and you probably already do this, but I'm just thinking about it now that 
um, to, to think about a, a potential worst case scenario where, where you have um, someone coming in from out of state with a lot of money and a lot of lawyers and, and picking this thing apart to do what they wanna do that's not in the best interest of this community or this county. And um, because that's coming. And, and so you gotta make this thing bulletproof and, and uh, not have any potential weasel words in there for someone who's got a lot of power uh, to try and overwhelm um, our, our community's decisions. So if, if, you, if you squeeze it through that lens, I think you'll be able to tighten up the language to really get to a point um, where, uh, where it appears that the, the people of, of um, the city and the, and the county want you. So um, anyways, uh, that's, that's about all I had, but I do again, um, really appreciate the, the professional way in which you're engaging the public on this one. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you for your comment. I am seeking more public comment. Second call for public comment. Joseph Dorn, state your name, address, and your comment, please. Uh, my name is Joe Dorn. I live on 893 East River Road. I'm 23 miles from the uh, city limits, uh, city limits of Livingston. Uh, but it's a place uh, that's very important to Park County. I'd like to echo the comments that were made by Michelle Uberaga and Frank Schroeder and, uh, and also Jen about the uh, uh, impact of sprawl and uh, Livingston has a great potential to be a, a fantastic uh, magnet for uh, everyone uh, in Park County or it can be uh, going the wrong direction. So I just uh, 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 would like to echo the comments made by Frank and Michelle and, and Jonathan and Jen. Thank you. Great. Thank you for your comment. Anyone else with a public comment on the ETJ? Erica Lighthizer, would you like to state your name, address, and make your comment, please? Yeah, thank you, Jesse. This is Erica Lighthizer, 528 South 8th Street here in Livingston. Um, echo all the comments that have come before me. Thank you, everyone, for in your involvement. Um, just a couple of quick things. Just want to raise up Jonathan's comment. Um, I'm also a little bit confused about the difference between the natural area and the parks and open space. And I still see, I made this comment last time, I still see really a lack of natural area and open space on the north side um, to the north of those north side neighborhoods. And I'd like that to be incorporated in a, uh, the vision for the north side. A lot of people use those lands for walking and um, biking currently. So I'd like to see that incorporated in a future draft. Thank you. Thanks, Erica. Is there any other public comment? Second call for public comment. Okay, third and final call for public comment on the ETJ. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and close public comment. Thank you all very much. We appreciate your, uh, your public comments this evening. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and open it up to board discussion now. Um, who wants to go first, board? Any, any comments? Tori, go ahead. Uh, so I have two specific comments about objectives from the ETJ section. <clears throat> um, the first is objective 3.3. Um, and it's, it's pretty minor, it's just about the language, <clears throat> but it says to ensure extraction of sand and gravel resources throughout the region that will negatively impact, that will not negatively impact the surrounding ecosystem. It goes on. Uh, I think a very simple word change would be helpful and have it say, ensure that extraction of sand and sand and gravel will not negatively impact and it, and it continues. Um, the way that it's written, it seems like we're saying it's a priority to ensure that there's extraction of sand and gravel. And I don't think that's what the authors meant. Okay, Tori, what page are you on? Do you mind? Um, 
I have written it down in notes, so I don't oh, actually know. Oh, I think know. it's on page 42, uh, it, objective 3.3. Objective 3.3, yep. Okay. Uh, it's, it's a very simple change, but I think it has a uh, profound difference in meaning to change the order of that sentence. Um, and then uh, objective 5.2, uh, and I, I know we're gonna get into this in, in finer minutiae when we get into the transportation section of the, of the main growth policy. Um, but I think that this applies, this should apply to the ETJ uh, as well. Um, so objective 5.2 says to develop multimodal transportation options in the ETJ. Um, for those who haven't heard the term multimodal, that just means more than just the automobile. Um, and I, I would suggest considering adding um, a strategy that requires the inclusion of connected sidewalks for subdivision development. Um, I think that that would promote the type of development that we're hearing is preferred by the public and I think the majority of the members of the board. Um, you would be amazed the impact on safety and also mode choice that sidewalks uh, promote. And if we were to have a strategy that requires sidewalk development, um, I think that would be helpful. Awesome. Jesse? Yes. Um, could we maybe have people say what page number they're referencing? I yep. mean, just to say strategy 2.3, it could be any section. And, you know, I kind of like to put it in perspective of which section we're talking about. So yep. could we maybe have that a little bit, some more clarification. In the future, when I'm taking these notes, I'll be sure to write down the page number. Yeah. So what, where were three? It was what? It was page 43. He referenced objective 5.3 and recommends a strategy in there. And the previous comment was on page 42 under uh, objective 3.3. Does anybody want to comment on Tori's uh, changes? Uh, Jesse, thanks for, for identifying those page numbers for me. Anytime. And, uh, you know, I think, Tori, also, if those are suggestions, you can absolutely make a motion on those, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I'm happy to let anyone else comment before I go ahead and make a motion. Go ahead, Taya. Quick question. Yeah, I was wondering if we want to, do we want to make a list of the changes and then, then vote, or how do you want to? proceed? We certainly could, but I'm thinking it would be really quick if we just, if, if anybody doesn't have any discussion on this one and they like it, we could just go ahead and make a motion and vote and move on. It's sort of my thought. I think well, I, have, I have a number of uh, other areas in, on that same, in that same okay. section. So, okay. I mean, I don't know if Brian has an idea. Go ahead, Brian. Well, I was just going to suggest if we're going to, I mean, if we take a vote though, do we have to get public comment again or not? Because I guess not, because this is only focused on the ETJ portion. Okay. Uh, no, I don't have any comment with on Tori's particular areas. I've got some other comments, but Stacy, if yours align with Tori's, why don't you go ahead? Well, it was just in the same area, but it wasn't the same as Tori's. So <laughs> that's why I was just wanting to try to keep it. If we're gonna discuss this section of goals and objectives and chapter three, then we can all go through and input what we have for chapter three, for instance, is what I was thinking. You know, I don't know. I might, I'm kind of thinking for time, you guys, that if we, if he's knocking out a strategy or an objective, let's knock it out, vote on it and move to the next one. That's my suggestion. Okay, okay. perfect. Tori, how are okay, you feeling? Like to put forward a motion to change the wording in objective 3.3 from ensure extra extraction of sand and gravel resources to say, ensure that extraction of sand and gravel resources will not negatively impact. I second that motion. Okay, Stacey, did you get the motion down? Mm -hmm. Well, to add that and insert that. 
on 3.3. Okay. Perfect. Let's go through and vote. Uh, Taya. Yes, four. Tori. Shannon. Four. Stacy. Four. Brian. Four. Jesse is also four. Motion passes. Thanks, Tori. I would also like to put forward a motion to add a strategy to objective 5.2. The strategy would require the inclusion of connected sidewalks for subdivision development in the ETJ. Do we have a second? I will second. Thank you. So Taya. Madam Chair, can I can I just add something? Uh, our, we have a city code that already requires sidewalk construction um, be the responsibility of the adjacent property owner. So, I mean, I think there's already some legislation in place. It's just a matter of enforcement of that, but I'm, I might not be fully understanding what Tori's talking about on that sidewalk continuity between subdivision to subdivision. Um, I know more recently with the Northtown subdivision, you know, the city required the developer to put sidewalks uh, in all public areas. Hence, we have sidewalks on scenic trail now from their property boundary to uh, from the east to their park property boundary on the west in, in all park areas or open space areas. So I, I think there's provisions in there that cover it already, but if, if, if the planning board agrees that we need to, I guess, re reemphasize that in the, in this growth policy, I, I don't have any issues with it. Okay. Thanks, Shannon. Um, should we continue with our vote? I, I, I think it, I, I think it helps to have it in there or it just reiterates uh, the policy that's already in place, maybe Shannon. Um, so, so we, just a question. Sorry. Yep. Was it five point, where, where was it being added? I have 5.2, but it doesn't make sense to add it to the objective. So it's strategy what, 5.2 what, which one? 5.2 point. I don't, I don't think the, the order of the strategy matters so long as it is included. Yeah. So you ask you, that you allow the planning department uh, <laughs> and the consultant to just do the numbering. So you, you're just adding one is all I'm getting at. It's, it's, a, it's a new one is yeah, what right. I'm saying. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, we have a motion by Tori. We have a second by Taya. We'll go through with uh, the vote. Taya. Four. Tori. Four. Shannon. Four. Stacy. Four. Brian. Four. And Jesse is also for motion passes. Thank you. Okay. Who else would make it like to bring up a discussion item for this section? Brian, I'll go next if. Great. Sure. It'll be all Fine. right. Um, thanks for all the public comment. That was interesting. Um, I have, Matthew, I think a question for you. One thing that's been kind of plaguing me lately, and, I, and you, you said it at the beginning, and I want to make sure I understand where this may be codified, whether we need to put this specifically in this document or whether it's already in state law where it's just redundant then. But as we were talking about the ETJ, you mentioned that in order for a, before a subdivision could get built that had the intent of connecting into city services, for lack of a better word, that it had to be annexed. Is that a, yeah, that's just the way it is according to statute, or is that something, um, I guess, where does that come from? I want to make, I, I just want, I agree with that is what I'm trying to say. And I want to make sure that it's clearly understood by anybody and everybody that may read this, that that's our intent. Um, yeah, so it's not required by state law. There are some requirements in state law about hooking up to city services, but we wouldn't be required to annex them. Uh, we have done service agreements with properties in the past um, that haven't been within the city. Um, that comes from, there's this recommendation in the growth policy is, uh, let me quickly see here. 
Uh, strategy 3.1.10, which is on page 41, which states require annexation prior to subdivision of any parcel in the ETJ. In regards to annexation, uh, generally the city doesn't pursue annexation if there's they're not proposing or they're not already on city services. So that's an annexation policy. Um, there is a strategy somewhere in the growth policy. It's not in the ETJ section uh, that talks about strengthening the annexation policy, but it's something certainly that we could add to the, to the ETJ section as well. No, thank you. I just totally missed that one. It's, I, I read it and it just, it, I just missed it. Thank you for that clarification. I feel much better. I guess, cause one of my biggest fears of the whole ETJ area was that as somebody mentioned, somebody with deep pockets could come in, build a subdivision outside of the city limits, outside of the planning area. And then at just some other time say, hey, yeah, we really want to now connect in and, and sort of do it as an after, uh, as a route, as a workaround or, or as an after, after effect. So thanks for having that in there. Um, I, I agree with the- clarifying point with that. Yeah, yeah go ahead. So because the growth policy is not a regulatory document, right. someone, even after the adoption of the growth policy, no matter how strong the language is in the sure. growth policy, could still do that. Um, yeah, the growth absolutely. Is one criteria. No, absolutely. But I, as somebody said, we need to make this ironclad on our intent. Um, I understand it's not regulatory, but, but what we want to do is try to intend, try to make our intent known for the city commission for the community for for the city on how we would like things to proceed but yeah there's going to be a lot of things out of our control so intense important in my mind um somebody brought up a really good point on the and it's covered in 3.1.9 page 41 maintaining existing agricultural uses within the etj i do agree and would like to have the discussion and i don't know how best to parse it out but on the new map sorry i'm scrolling back up to it uh, on the new map where we have the, what's called the agricultural and very low density residential, just like we did with the growth, with the, um, sorry, with the maps last time, I'm wondering if we could highlight those areas that are used for current agricultural uses today and try to try to hold those off separately and, and, and identify those separately. Um, and again, basically with the intent of voicing that that's something that we would like to retain as part of our, as part of our, um, uh, as part of our, you know, I was about to say heritage, that's the wrong word, but it's just as far, as far as what our core values are, I think we are a very agricultural based town. And so I'm wondering if it would be possible to break out that agricultural, very low density residential into what is basically highlighting that which is agricultural today. Do you, do you think we could make that change? Here, if you don't mind, can I uh, make a request? Yeah, sure. Um, if you are going to make that change, and I think that's an appropriate change to make based on public comment, if you could give us some direction on um, what the criteria you would like to use to split those parcels out, um, whether it's, you know, the property being listed as qualified or non-qualified ag land on the Montana cadastral, so basically for tax purposes, um, or, you know, I provided you with a map showing parcel sizes if you want to do it based on existing parcel size um, or something like that, that would be very helpful in guiding us on how to split those out. Sure. I would, I would, I would do actual not qualified because I know some people qualify for tax benefit, but that's just my opinion. Um, maybe there's some experts out there that could give us a better range, but I, I think qualified is how I, I'd be sorry. I think actual is how I would recommend we identify those areas. You know, Brian, yeah. if I may, I had a, a very similar thought to yours in looking in the on the map page 18 exhibit 2.6 where it gives farmland classification. Uh, you know, we have, you know, my thoughts on the the ETJ and the big tan area is we already have some maps in here, the farm 
farm uh, land map is one of them. The public lands map is the other. Um, the six, 2016 land cover map is another. So page 14, page 16, page 18, and they all sort of already have areas that are suitable or are being used in certain ways. Uh, in addition to this map, which shows parcel size. So I was yeah. thinking that we could use these maps to start designating areas within the donut or the ETJ uh, as, uh, as how we want those, how we want them to be used in the future and uh, based on how they are currently being used if we are in agreement with that. So- And, and, I, agree, and I agree, thank you for reminding me too. And I even have my note here and I'm, that was my next bullet. I didn't get to it. Mm -hmm. uh, it what's called exhibit 2.6. I think if we use that as the foundation, which is um, farmland in the ETJ, which has the a farmland of statewide importance, prime far, farmland if irrigated. I think if we capture those two things, again, this is just our, uh, again, it's just a planning document, but I think if we capture those things and say, you know, and for sure the farmland of statewide importance, those should be really protected as much as possible. The prime farmland should be protected. Um, um, the non-prime farmland is probably um, um, and unclassified are probably better targets of, of development. So I, I would use that as my foundation. This is, yeah, my, my concern with that is it doesn't account mm -hmm. for racing land. Um, so we're, we're, we would just be basing it on farmland. Uh, true. Um, I'm wondering. I mean, I would think you could, I, I think though you could probably say the entire the entire area is probably for great. You could probably graze the entire ETJ. I mean, I mean, maybe except for some which is portions of the right? south. I'm sorry, what was that? I said, which is the beauty of it, right? Yeah, it is. And so, but we we don't want to handcuff ourselves. Again, we don't want this to say development is not allowed anywhere. So we have to have some parameters where development is possible to then give our city commissioners the, as I've said before, the information they need to make sure that we have appropriate policies and zoning in place to make sure it looks like we want. So we can't, I'm afraid of restricting everything and just saying, well, we can't do anything anywhere because I don't think that's practical. I don't think it's realistic. And I think if we do, we just tie our hands and we, using the sprawl word, what we find is sprawl takes, starts taking place up Highway 89, I-90 and, in other in other places, so so I, I would still limit it to farmland, but I could easily be talked out of that. The I think that's why I love the the maps that Matthew prepared because I think also you know some some of the boundary lines have already you know it's kind of predetermined what's going to see pressure for you know low density residential looking at the cadastral. Um, so I'm just, I'm wondering too about it, about coming at it from the approach of parcel size. Um, and, and because we see in those subdivided areas, you know, there's already roads there. Um, so thinking about parcel size and where there aren't existing roads, you know, that would mean putting in roads and, and such. So trying to pr preserve those large spaces. I, I'm, I'm not as big a fan as that, mostly because anybody can sell a parcel to anybody they want and do anything they want with it, especially within the county, because we don't really have any zoning regulations in the county. Um, so I think it's, I'm not sure that size matters in this case. I think, again, I would focus more on what's, what that land is being used for, what that land is being used for today um, and potentially continuing to be used for in the future. Uh, and so just again, my opinion, I would stick with farmland only. Brian? And, oh, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just wondering I'm, if you stick with farmland only, that doesn't address things like the five acre tracks and, and established areas that are already, like uh, Taya said, have streets in them. And the, the farmland designation really only applies 
primarily up north. So um, it, it, it seems that it isn't gonna cover everything. It, it wasn't intended to cover everything, but my point was, I think those are areas of importance that are worth extra focus on potentially trying to protect um, because of what they have, especially from a local sustainability perspective, you know, um, again, I, we can't, I don't think, again, it's, I don't think it makes sense for us to try to protect everything and come up with a, 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 um, a limitation for everything. I mean, they're, we're, we're not going to be able to, again, this isn't regulatory. We can't control that. I think what we want to be able to, our intent, what we want to telegraph to the city commission to the community is we find that our farming um, lands are very important to what we are as a community. We want to try to retain those as much as possible. And therefore, as we're doing our annexation, our zoning, and setting up our public policies, we want to make sure that those are protected. I'm not as concerned about protecting a 640 acre lot or a five acre lot or things like that. Those things are those things will develop or not based on, you know, a lot of different factors, mostly on whether somebody or not wants to sell that piece of land. May I ask, Matthew, you included this parcel size map and, and I'm, I'm wondering kind of what your, what your thinking was. Um, it was basically just for information, but I just sort of wanted to show you, we had a lot of discussion about, um, you know, dividing the, the ETJ up into two acre parcels and, you know, what that could look like. And I just wanted to give you all a background on um, basically what the what the ETJ looks like right now. Um, and if you look at it, a lot of it's been divided, especially south of town into 20 acre parcels, which is based on a historic Montana state law, which allowed you to do that without subdivision review until uh, basically the early 90s. Um, but it was basically just to give you all a a background on what it, what it looks like on the ground, so to speak, uh, at this point in time. Um, the larger parcels are obviously a good indicator of where either existing ag or public uh, lands are. Well, and that's my thought. I'm thinking probably most of those larger parcels are ag. So if we actually did look at what is existing ag um, grazing or farmland, my concern would be with just doing farmland is, uh, you know, I don't want to take away someone's ability um, if they don't have prime farmland to make a living in ag. Um, so I, I would be, I would lean more towards identifying those areas that are existing agriculture. And if I may make a quick suggestion. Um, so Montana Cadastral, which is basically what DOR uses to uh, assess properties throughout the state and is publicly available, breaks out existing um, agricultural land into basically two categories, which is qualified ag, which means you've went through the process with the state to qualify your agricultural land. Uh, and there's a set of criteria with that in non-qualified agricultural land. Um, I think if we use that land use categorization, it gives you a pretty good uh, indication of where the existing agricultural land is. That also includes grazing land. It doesn't uh, it doesn't exclude that. So what they're calling agricultural land is gonna be grazing uh, and crop production. Basically um, people making money off of either uh, crops or, or uh, livestock. So what I recommend is we make a motion to make that change. We see what that ends up looking like after that change so we can visualize it. And then we may have to revisit that at a future time if it doesn't look like we think it's gonna look like, but I, I, I like that because we're letting the data, we're letting with the statewide data, we're letting it do the decision for us versus trying to eyeball it and figure it out. So I, I recommend we use the science. So I'd like to, let me go ahead and do that. I'd like to make that motion now to use the, uh, use the statewide qualified data to update the map, I'm sorry, that's identifies, um, oh gosh, help me out, Matthew. What did you, did you say identifies Cadastral. qualified cadastral, thank you, cadastral lands for updating map on, what is that map number? Um, sorry, bail with me. There isn't a number on it, it's page 11 in the packet. 
Uh, okay, no, yeah, oh, yeah, well, exhibit 2.8. 2.6 um, is the farmland. Yeah, but, but to update uh, exhibit 2.8, which is the recommended, um, I'm sorry, am I in the right one? Yeah, yes, 2.8. Just one quick clarification on the motion. Um, yeah. We are, are we including both qualified and non-qualified ag land in that uh, change? Can you identify non-qualified again? What what is that? It's um, basically agricultural land that either hasn't gone through the state process to become qualified or doesn't meet the criteria. Uh, one of the criteria being, and the only one I know off the top of my head, uh, that you make three thousand dollars. I think it is off of it. The products uh, produced on the property. I would, uh, my motion is for qualified only. Can I ask a clarifying question? Yeah, I'm confused. Me too. Uh, how, how, Matthew, how different would that cadastral map be with listing the qualified ag land in the ETJ differ from exhibit 2.6 on page 18. Very significantly. Uh, we have a, a large amount of um, grazing land that is not, so prime farmland is based on soil basically uh, and nothing else. Uh, which is why you see that prime farmland uh, existing down uh, the creeks and along the river corridor. Um, there is a, a huge amount of grazing land. Uh, if you can see my mouse on the screen, sort of where I am circling. Um, if you've ever been up on the bench up there, you've seen it. Uh, there, there are thousands of acres of grazing land up there. Uh, so it, it would be pretty significantly different. Okay, and then I have one more question on that. There is also this land cover map, which designates pasture, Oh, I'm sorry, it's on page 14, it's exhibit 2.3. And it does designate pasture and grassland. Is that, is that, and that's fairly significant. Um, would that be more in line with what the cadastral map would be looking at? Is, is sort of the grassland and the pasture designation on this map? No, so cadastral is going to specifically be look at, looking at land use. So the state okay. breaks out specific parcels into specific land use, and that's how they tax it. Um, this is just uh, taking an aerial image and then running a, an analysis on it, basically. And based on, um, it's a little bit complicated, so I'm going to oversimplify it and probably not get it completely correct. Um, it's basically based on the reflectivity of the land is how it's designated it. Um, so if you zoomed out, almost all of Montana would look like some sort of pasture grassland because that's what our natural environment is mm -hmm. um, versus the cadastral, which is gonna break it down parcel by parcel uh, based on the existing land use of that parcel. Okay. So really what Brian, you wanna do is establish the- Qualify, the, right. The qualified, qualified, what's identified as the qualified lands in the cadastral, the cadastral database um, onto the UTJ map to, instead of having the two criteria of, sorry, agriculture and very low density residential, break, break that out as a separate agricultural designation of something that we intend to have higher interest in preserving. Okay. Does that make sense? I think so. It'd just be so nice to see what that looks like. Right. And I, yeah. I think we need, yeah, I think we need to see it. And, and we may, after looking at it, it, it again, I don't know how, how much that is. Um, but I think it's important we try to, I think we try to, I think we try to convey our intent that we think that is an important part of our of our local culture that we'd like to try to retain. Okay. Okay. Quick question. Jump in again quickly think, here. Yeah. If uh, I I am sitting on my work computer, if you don't mind a ten minute recess, I can actually get you a map of that area pretty quickly here. Uh, I'm slightly concerned it's going to crash. Uh, Zoom running at the same time, um, but that's up to you <laughs> if you want to take that time or not. I'm going to need about ten minutes to do that. Do you want to get working? Oh, 
do you need to shut this down to do that? Is that what you meant, Matthew? I don't think I need to shut it down, but it may uh, it may break in the process. So we, <laughs> oh, we would need so to make the 10 minute recess for sure. So we couldn't discuss something else while you're working on it is what you're saying. We can, and Jesse's the co-host, so if I lose you here, you should be fine. Um, but okay. I'm just giving you warning in advance, um, and I can we can see how it works, and if it works, uh, no issues. Okay. okay, and then I have just, and then I just have one more comment. So we'll see what that looks like. I'll hold my motion. Uh, I'll pull my motion until we can take a look at that. One more quick question, or maybe comment, and. and so there's been a lot of discussion about the purple, what I'll call the purple area, which is the sand and gravel pits um, designated as manufacturing. Um, and there's some discussion of going, well, should we identify of what's it being used for today? I don't really know the answer to this, but I, one thing I do wanna have put on everybody's radar scope again is, if you'll all recall when we did the surveys last spring, Again, it's been a long time. We've heard a lot of public comment since then. But one of the highest priorities that people identified of what they wanted in this growth policy and what they wanted the city to focus on was manufacturing jobs. Um, so I do think, again, we have to be careful not to just accept the recent testimony we re we've received but a year's worth of comment that we have received that we do have to take that into account that a large portion of the community was, it was rated very, very high, was seeking for the city to try to come up with ways to bring more manufacturing. So I do wanna make sure we don't lose sight of that, that, um, you know, I realize that's sand and gravel today, but, you know, four years from now, they may close shop and, that may be a great spot for um, some new light manufacturing. So um, I'm a fan of keeping it as manufacturing because again, I just think we need to make sure that we meet the intent of that population, which focalized that so heavily during the survey. And those were my only questions for this part. So Brian, my yeah. only comment, can I comment on the manufacturing? Um, you realize that the majority of that land is a, a cliff. Yep. You know, it goes up a hill, half a mile, and all of it is cliff land. And that it is uh, the exact opposite of what we've been hearing in that it's way outside of the, you know, city because it's it's on the way in, in into the country north up the Swingley route and up to uh, Immigrant Peak. And so it, it's like, it's, I heard that we, we need to have manufacturing for work. This is true. But I also heard that it needs to have, be located closer in town. In a I, manufacturing I, 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 if then I we probably need to annex, then we may need to annex some, or we may need, not annex, wrong word, that we may need to identify that in the future land use possibly. Maybe that's what we, instead of the mixed use, maybe, well, I guess that is, but um, no, I agree. That's not where I would necessarily plan to put manufacturing. My point being is though, I think it's important to identify some manufacturing yeah. somewhere, I but I don't, I, don't, I don't know where to tell you the truth. It is a good place in terms of transportation impacts on the community, however, for manufacturing. Uh, if you were to put a, a smaller manufacturing center somewhere closer to town, uh, you're going to have uh, freight, freight vehicles coming through town and um, occupy, a, a single freight vehicle occupies about four, um, the space of four um, personal vehicles. Um, and where that where that's located is actually would really limit uh, the impact the transportation impacts of uh, developing manufacturing uses. Um, I'm not saying that I that I necessarily support promoting manufacturing there because I don't think I fully understand what the ecological impacts would be. But my area of expertise is transportation, and from that standpoint, that's actually a pretty good place to put it. Well. I think my point was just that um, 
I could see having the portion that's on the flat next to the adjacent area that's all the storage sheds and all of that, which already looks like a manufacturing area, but it's mostly storage units and it's got some businesses across the interstate on the flat part, which is only probably a half a mile or a quarter of a mile of that section is where I think if you were gonna have manufacturing, you would have that smaller portion and you would not have it go up the hill or the whole mile up and where the sand and gravel pit is and keep that as sand and gravel. I would just keep it down next to the existing, um, I think it's considered mixed use right now, but so if you had to industrial. Maybe we'd have to have two different distinctions, um, have the manufacturing where you're suggesting, which I think makes sense. And then like yeah. extraction or natural resources or something like that. And again, I, those aren't all concepts that I love in a uh, ecologically sensitive area, but uh, I feel like that if, find some balance between all of the input from all the constituents. That's my concern though, is that we're recommending uh, this area when we there hasn't been an ecological impact assessment or studied. Um, so I could see, I know there is existing industry there. And so I could see designating what is specifically already used. Um, industrially but I you know that's a that is a larger area than what exists currently that's being designated um, so I would I would lean towards what's currently being used so are you saying oh, I, Taya, are you saying Taya that you're talking about the 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 land that's within the city limits or are you talking about the manufacturing land designated the man, in the ETJ the manufacturing the manufacturing Thank, land. you're saying keep it as manufacturing land Oh, meaning I would like I would like to because I think the idea before that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, Matthew said that it's it was designated as such because it's already there. But it's a you, sand and gravel. It's not it's not that size yet, um, and so I would I would be inclined to not designate it that size and you know without study. I think there's some really good points here. So one is Brian, Brian's point is we should designate some area for manufacturing based on previous public comment. Uh, however, how big of an area and where is sort of also what I'm hearing. Um, uh, so that, I mean, those are just two points. And so Stacy, you know, I do agree with you too, is I, I always think and even refer to whether it's correct or not is the industrial area just past the hospital. So, and I don't know, I assume that sort of how it's zoned is commercial or, or uh, in industrial commercial or something like that, but that would be one area. And then I have, I don't understand exactly what the, what is going on with the railroad area. Um, I don't know if that is a spot we could even mention um, because it's already oh. fair, fairly oh, we, manufacturing like. We did kind of I will say just for the sake of moving on, we did kind of capture all that in our discussions last week of how to designate all those lands that are within the city limits. So I, I don't know if I want to open that up again, but um, a lot of that's mixed use. Um, I can't remember the stuff, um, how it, uh, east of the hospital there, the industrial area. I don't remember how that's designated off the top of my head. Well, but, um, I, right. I'd recommend I'm not trying we, to open that up. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. So, so if I we want to, so, so Stacy, I think your idea or whoever's idea was of, of maybe parsing that pink area into a slash manufacturing slash whatever the right word is, sand and gravel, splitting it into what it's used today now for, showing how it could be possibly used for in the future. But obviously, with anything we do, there should be studies done on any of this land. Uh, regarding, you know, the viability of it in, from an ecological perspective and transportation perspective and everything else. So that's got so, all those caveats wrapped around it. So I guess if, if I had to make a motion just to move things along, and then you guys can agree or disagree, then I would make a motion to remove the manufacturing designation um, to 
all of the land that is above in elevation. Well, that's how I don't know how to say this. It's almost how like about, you want to. Stacy, how about any? Well, how about any land that's not currently being used for, and I don't know the proper word for it, sand and gravel extract? Well, so by exception, may I, I guess. this is Shannon. May I, may ahead, I Shannon. offer a suggestion? Um, so I, I, I think this is a great discussion. And I think if you look at like the cadastral maps um, and look at the ownership of this area, um, you know, there, there is some city of Livingston land that's covered under this manufacturing. There's some park county land that I doubt uh, those two government entities are going to probably meet that zoning classification. Uh, I do know there's room for Fisher sand and gravel to expand. Um, so if you look at their property ownership, uh, I think what I'm hearing is, is I think we're all in agreement that 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 uh, industry or business could expand within their property limits. Um, so if we want to get that granular, I think, I think, I think we could take the city property out the county property where the, um, where the sheriff's department has a shooting range there. Um, and, you know, you take that out and then are we talking about if, if we're not comfortable with it being manufacturing, making that other area mixed use pink, which is basically what the business park at the intersection of Swingley and 89 is already. <laughs> I guess, I guess Shannon, I was thinking that it should remain uh, sand and gravel designation other than the small area that's down on the flats, uh, basically underneath the interstate or next to the interstate. That's all I was referring to. And I can't tell exactly which is city land and which is county land um, on the parcel map. And you can't tell anything from the 2.8 map as to where the designations are. So I don't know, we can't, I don't have enough information to make a, a good decision on how to do that. So maybe Matthew has to shed some light on it. Sorry, Matthew. Yeah, no worries. Can I make a suggestion here? Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> this map doesn't look exactly like I want it to look, but it does work for this one um, particular parcel. So if you look at this bright blue area here, that's shown on cadastral as industrial rural, which is where the gravel pits are. Um, it may be prudent just to use that parcel line as the new boundaries of the manufacturing area. Um, that should incorporate all of the gravel pits into that area and it is one parcel, so it allows us to follow parcel lines. So in doing that, if you said that it, all right, Industrial help me with this then. Rural. Is it currently considered, is there a designation for sand and gravel? Or is it, as you said, in light industrial? What it, which is it? Uh, so the gravel pits on cadastral are just considered industrial. Uh, I'm trying to pull up the, what, so the way our data is, and unfortunately it's not ideal for this, uh, for what we're talking about, it's, broken out and basically it's only use type listed here as industrial rural. So it's listed as an industrial property. Um, as you can see, it's the only one out there listed as such other than the uh, lumber yard to the south of town. I, and, I, okay, I'll go ahead. I think one of the um, things that is confusing, uh, the designation is manufacturing, it is not, isn't, it somehow it was inserted as a land use designation, but I don't think it's in the definitions. I think it's an employment sector. So I, I think technically that would be whether it's light industrial or heavy industrial, I don't know, but I think it would be industrial, not manufacturing, correct, Matthew? Yeah, and uh, the listing on, um, if you look at pages 102 and 103, which I provided you in your packet, uh, I think the most appropriate one would be industrial, which just says industrial land use designations are areas which are devoted to manufacturing, storage and distribution, businesses, operations, assembly and processing. Um, that mostly fits 
if you wanted to create a new uh, designation that is also acceptable. So what would that designation look like? What would it be to prevent future development of that land? I, I, if I can speak up, I think industrial covers it because that handles the, I mean, I think it count, co covers the manufacturing element we were looking for and it, and it covers distribution, um, which is sort of a light manufacturing, I think, and, and what it's being used for today. So I would argue that I think that designation would probably work for us. And are we suggesting we're shrinking the original purple uh, designation to this blue? I would. I would move that we adjust, modify the map to reflect the cadastral blue parcel. I, I think it needs to have more than just the blue because I think if you look at land ownership, RY Timber owns, owns property on Swingley Road, that, that rectangle down to I-90. Um, there is there. I, I don't. I agree that it shouldn't go any farther east than Chicken Creek, but there is some industrial activity that goes on up in the Chicken Creek area. Personally, I agree, Shannon, with including that the rectangle for for the timber company. So I will modify my motion. Um, and that rectangle is is the one next to the road, Swingley Road. Mm -hmm. And and that other little piece of triangle is is what? Who owns that? Yeah, who owns the triangle that isn't part of the rectangle? Yeah, <laughs> who owns that? <laughs> the gravel company owns that parcel. Yeah, so and owns that. color that in. So, I will modify the motion to include the rectangle and the miniature triangle. <laughs> oh, and they own that too. Oh, they own that too. So <laughs> basically why we, so I think everything that was in the original map now almost, right? Or I guess yeah. maybe uh, removing the, would it be the, what, Shannon, would it be the city and the county? And, Or how about on this purple map, anything to the east of the river or the creek here? The, so, so, so the area east of Chicken Creek is, is where Park County owns and that's where the landfill that's been basically abandoned and restored. Um, You could certainly shave off a, a good chunk of the purple Taya if you if you went uh, uh, west of Chicken Creek, but then you're okay. you're kind of going into this little beige color and this green color a little bit too. I guess why are we trying to shave it? Is my point. I mean, because it's huge. I think is it's why it's huge. It's huge. What right, about but it but well, is it? But it sounds like to me that it's either it's either timber, it's either gravel, it's either abandoned um, dumping area. Um, I'm not sure that it's uh, again. I don't. I, I don't. I don't see a problem with that necessarily. But I think uh, I think I like the gentleman's comment. Has said you know think of the worst case scenario. And that's what I think of when I see how big this purple is, is the worst case scenario. So I, I would prefer we start conservatively uh, on this one um, because the amount of land encompassed in that purple seems to be quite a bit. And if somebody did wanna come in and put something gigantic in there, that would be concerning. So this is Shannon again, and uh, you know, thank you, Jesse, Madam Chair, but the, the cursor, the arrow that's on the, I would say, I, I don't know, it's a dark, dark pink color. That, that parcel, the city owns the, I would say the, the south half of that. 
and the rest of that is all owned by Fisher as well. So, I mean, you're getting, uh, I understand where Brian's coming. I mean, I think if we want to systematically look at property ownership and, and make sure that we're putting the right color associated with who owns the land and what we've, I think we're talking about and agree should be labeled industrial or manufacturing or whatever, but, 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 you know, we're, we're, we're approaching Chicken Creek and I guess that's where I'm saying, I, I agree there shouldn't be anything east of Chicken Creek that's, that's purple, but I think we need to look at each parcel closer and decide on what color it needs to be. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks, Shannon. Uh, that's I, I agree, and maybe and 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 a buffer for the creek too, right? I mean, would be my other I, conservation guess. Ted Ted Watson gave that that parcel that's just east of the blue that was split between Fisher Sand and Gravel in the city. So, um, you know, I can work with Matthew on where that where city ownership of that land uh, occurs. I don't want to explain it in this meeting, but um, I do think we need to, anything that is owned by Fisher probably needs to be the color we decide on for Fisher. Great. Well, we could put a park up there on the gravel pit. <laughs> well, so do we have a do we have a motion then? <laughs> do you have a, do you want to amend your or? What? I know. So I'm trying to think because I know like like even there's a triangle there that I think is owned by Heartland K Ranch. That is that currently in the purple, Matthew? Well, I yes, it is purple. It's, yeah, I, yeah. It's, there's a lot of purple there, so there's a lot of different property ownership involved. So I guess area. I would. Hmm. The Heart K owns that that again dark pink or that's kind of at the inter intersection of High I ninety and Chicken Creek to the to the west. So, do do we want to make an amendment to the motion to basically um, create this industrial area based on current use not to extend east of Chicken Creek. Is that kind of what we're saying? That might be a good. Don't ask me to repeat it again. <laughs> <laughs> I would ask just so we can actually make a map that you base it on specific landmarks or parcel lines. Uh, current use is going to be impossible to determine other than what's yeah, shown up here. So the current use is the basically just the blue. So I would say the purple and the blue that's non not public property, i.e. not city county property up to Chicken Creek. Is that um, doable? It still seems like an awfully large area of land that doesn't seem to be what we're talking about. Can't we just make it simpler and just say we, we want to just shrink the area down to the the blue area of um, that's owned by Fisher land and gravel? Well, then back to my original point, though, is I think we I think it's imperative for us to at least make considerations of where we may want light industrial to acknowledge the comments made by the public. Basically what this does is just limits us to what already exists. And I mean, that's, if that's the way we want to go, that's the way we go. But um, I think it would be beyond, because I don't think Fisher Stand and Gravel is currently using all of that land. So Vacant would, land rural. It would allow for expansion um if we kind of followed the blue and the pink up to the yeah. green say that again taya um i think it would allow for expansion of that industrial area if we allowed for the pink east of swingley up to the green so 
Who's, who's drawing that? Matthew. <laughs> Matthew is yes. drawing that? Okay. That's exactly, yeah, exactly. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, but I like the ding. Sorry, that was my computer. Oh, I was like, there it is. <laughs> but yes, that's the area I'm thinking about. So we're shrinking the manufacturing area that was there down to this much is what we're, we're is what we're coming up with. Yes, is that the motion? And to create the, and to keep, to return that to industrial use, is that right? Yeah, so I'll, I'll um, I'm modifying my motion to be the area that Matthew has highlighted uh, is industrial. So I would also like to change the label in the map to industrial. I'll second that. Okay. Let's vote. Taya. Yes, Cece, sorry, did you have a question? Uh, just to clarify that that eliminates in and it's part of that motion then, then the rest of that land that has been designated as manufacturing is no longer going to be designated as that. Just want to clarify that. Correct. Okay. 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 Taya. Four. Tori. Four. Shannon. Four. Stacy. Four. Brian. Four. And Jesse is four. Okay. Motion passes. Good job. Um, okay. Should we go back to the ag question? Yeah. Do does anybody need a break at 7:15? We have been one hour and 45 minutes. Let's take five. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we are going to take five minutes at my clock says 713. So we'll come back at 718. Okay, how's everybody doing? Hanging in there?
Okay, I've got 718. Do you guys? Yep. Let's get back to it. Okay. okay. Um, I hope everybody had a good five minutes. Okay, so here we are looking at the certified ag designations from cadastral, correct? Not quite. So based on the data we have, um, the ag categories have been broken out and you can see there by acreage here, which you can just ignore. Um, but the two main categories we're seeing here for farmland are irrigated acres and grazing acres. Uh, you can see anything that's colored here has is basically classified by the state as grazing land. And if I quickly switch it over here, uh, those are the lands that are currently irrigated. So they're currently irrigated farmland. Um, unfortunately, based on our data, I don't have the anything that's gonna just split it out to qualified. Uh, Non-qualified is one category in our data. Uh, and unfortunately qualified is a whole bunch of different categories. So the first map, was all the, the first, yeah. So this, this is, is land classified by the state as grazing land. Just grazing, Matthew? Correct. And does grazing include agriculture and ranching or no? Uh, I wouldn't separate those two from each other. Um, grazing is going to be considered an agricultural use, but it's gonna be uh, generally, you know, cattle grazing on unirrigated lands. Matthew, is there any way then to do grazing and Cropland? Uh, yes, but it might take me a little bit more time. So, it, sorry, Stacey, I was just going to say, you could we use the the map that we have that designates farmland and this map, and and make that the designation that Brian was thinking about for his motion. Potentially, would that cover it? Well, we could, but then we pretty much cover the entire ETJ, and that's not what I was trying to get to. I think we do have to make some hard decisions on where. Um, Matthew, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, Taya had her hand up, I think. I was wondering, do, does, does this need to fall on boundary lines as well? That, that, was, that was my comment, or that's what I was gonna get at, is that, I, again, I, I've said this before, I think what we're doing here is visioning. We're not, we're not doing zoning, we're not making decisions on specific parcels. And so the, the sentiment that I get from public comment is that the vision for the ETJ is to remain as pastoral and open as possible. So if we produce a map that shows the entire ETJ as our vision is that it will remain open and pastoral, I don't know why we have to break it into qualified farmlands or not. Why can't we just give it that designation that, that for, in my opinion is reflective of the comment and I think reflective of, of the, the sentiment well stated. Yeah, I agree. And then that only leaves a second, a third category, I guess, or a second. And that would be the areas closest to like south of town, the five acre tract area, what, whatever we want to designate that for, because that's not currently farmland per se. And well, that's where, where sprawl is kind of. Something that I was going to argue is that we could use existing roadways um, as, as some kind of rule to determine where, if any development were to happen within the ETJ, that we would require that it happens um, with some contingency, like it connected to existing roadways. Basically, it, it, 
you can't develop sprawl into the ETJ without building new roads. And so if we say we're limiting whatever, you know, low density residential, which is kind of, it, low density residential is sprawl. But if we're, if, if we're, if there's, if we're to allow that anywhere, we're gonna allow that in areas that already have existing, existing roadways, something to that effect. Mm -hmm. So could you call, would you, would you call, would you designate the ETJ natural area slash open space? I mean, I think that's the vision that we're hearing. And I think that, I mean, I think, I think that that avoids this minutia that's bogging us down. And I think it's representative of, of, as I said before, the sentiment of public comment and, and the spirit of the growth policy in general. Matthew, is there any reason why we, can you, is there any reason why we wouldn't, can you give us an idea about our train of thought? Uh, yeah, I don't think that's a bad idea. Um, I think if you look at uh, this map is probably the best one. Uh, a lot of the areas along existing roadways are already divided into smaller parcels. Generally, where there are roads, there are smaller parcels because there was a reason to put a road in in the first place. Um, so I think that's a good suggestion. Um, just if you are going to make a motion, some clarity on how you want that shown on the map, if that's parcels that are directly sort of in, uh, touching, I guess, or intersecting an existing road, or if you want some sort of buffer around the existing roads of the area to show, uh, would be helpful. I mean, I, I, the way that I'm seeing it, and, and I'm, I'm open to, to everybody else's input on this, but the, the way that I'm seeing this represented in a map is it represented in a map, we have the entire ETJ as open land and pastoral. And then included with that map, we have an objective or a strategy. Uh, the objective is something to the effect of limit low density residential development within the ETJ. Strategy, yeah. uh, do not allow the construction of new roads for the purpose of of developing residential um, projects within the ETJ. Something, something like that. That's exactly where we're trying to go. Okay, well, I think that's I great. <laughs> who's gonna make that? Who, who's who's got that in words? I I'll do my best. Um, I make a motion that we create. A new, rap, new map that indicates that our vision for the ETJ, which is to preserve open space and pastoral environments. <laughs> um, in support of that map, I suggest that we create a new objective and that objective is to promote policies which continue the effort of maintaining open space in the ETJ. Finally, adding a strategy to that objective, which states that new roads for the developed for the purpose or built for the purpose of facilitating residential development not be allowed to be constructed within the ETJ. Yes. Got a second. Uh, one more point on that. Did you want to talk about those areas that are on the roads be designated as very low density residential? I don't think that suggesting low density residential helps the, the purpose of, okay. of that objective. Can I just ask for one yeah. clarification as well? Um, the motion says new map. So do you want a new map or do you want to replace the, to replace the existing map with the areas currently shown as very low density as open space? The whole area, can you just give me some more specifics on exactly what you want to see on the map? Don't you just want to turn the tan to uh, green? Which or number are you on? Which number are you looking on, Jesse? Um, Exhibit uh, 2.8, isn't it? 
uh, okay. 2.8, you just want to turn the tan to light green, correct? 2.8 on page 22. Right. That's, not, that's not what I heard. No. Oh, no. Okay. I, I think we're, we're adding a new color, aren't we, Tori? <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. I think I, I think that yeah I think that park and open. I mean I yeah I guess we should probably make it a new color, um, and uh, something to the effect of pastoral and open space. Um, yeah, Tori, Tori, if I could, right now it's all tan, and that's the agricultural and very low density residential. So basically, so, if we kept it tan and then carved out the areas around the roads, and that's probably what we want to keep it as a different, that might make it easier to, from a graphics but, perspective. Sure, and I, I don't know that it's necessary to carve out the parts near the roads, because I think that again we're 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 large picture visioning and okay. i think that, that i think that that objective and that strategy clarifies that those roads are there and so that's yep. that's something that is that is still basically we're, we're we're developing policy to facilitate this goal um and that that objective or that strategy is that policy but that but the vision isn't the the vision is is broader and the vision is this is open and pastoral, pastoral space around Livingston. So could I say then on map, again, just to make this easy, exhibit, if we take exhibit 2.8 and what is now identified as a tan color is agricultural slash very low density residential. We instead call that pastoral lands or wh whatever words you you chose that I, might I, I, I would I would say open space and pastoral lands. Pastoral okay. lands covers it too. Um, okay. So, uh, what I mean, and and I guess Tori, I think the only thing that I I see you're saying the overview, but I think it would be also very easy for Matthew to just currently fill in those road spaces on the north part that are already that have the roads. There's just about it's a. Uh, that's shown on, um, on one of the other maps. You know where I, I mean, Matthew? I, I, I know what you mean. And I, I feel Jim. that those areas within the vision are still part of that open space and pastoral and changing the color of those places that are already, and I think, and I, I think that this is kind of what we're hearing from the public, already heading in the wrong direction uh -huh. to, to highlight them as, areas that that we vision a different kind of development other than open and pastoral. I think that okay. that might signal to policymakers at the city council that that's where that's where the planning board thinks that future growth could go. And then, the, I, okay, I will agree with you on that. Um, then it still leaves me with a little bit of concern for the other ETJ, ETJ part that is currently labeled as medium density residential and all, all the land that goes down on the road of Highway 89 South that's yellow and medium density and in the floodplain and all of that. So that might be a different discussion or a different motion for that portion of the land. Can we can we do it that way then? Mm -hmm. I think that makes sense. I, okay. I would, I, I, Cool second another question uh, is it is it safe to say that the area we're talking about is um i think we all agree that we're talking about every bit of land that's within our more than a half a mile from the city limits because <laughs> i do think there needs to be further discussion about um areas that are adjacent to infrastructure and and and, and directly right. adjacent to right. the city limits are you talking, Shannon? 
We have a motion on the table, so I would request that the planning board either make a second to that motion or or not, and then have a discussion on it, um, just so we don't try to keep amending the motion that Tori's made without actually having a second or any discussion. Taya did could second. You, could you restate the Could you restate the motion, please? I've I've got to admit I've lost the original motion at this point. I can read it. Do you want me to read it, Tori, or do you got it? Um, I think that'd be great. Yeah, if you read it. Okay, all right. So Tori made a motion to create a new map that envisions our ETJ uh, to preserve open space and pastoral environment and in support of creating a new, oh, oh gosh, maybe I didn't, create a new map that envisions our ETJ to preserve open space and pastoral environment and in support, create a new objective promoting policy, though, and the objective is, Promoting policies that ensure, a, oh shoot, my handwriting, effective. <laughs> oh shoot. I'll just I'll just fill that in for you. Thank you, please. Promote policies that facilitate the continuation of the open space surrounding the city limits, and then there's a strategy. Uh, which is to not allow the development or the, the construction of new roads, which would facilitate residential development within the ETJ. And Taya seconded. So we're going to go through the motion. We're going to go through roll call. Uh, Taya. Four. Tori. Four. Shannon. Four. Stacy. Four. Brian. Four. And Jesse is four. Great. Motion passes. Nice work. Okay. But now I'd like to discuss the other part of that. Perfect. Which I believe Shannon was alluding to, which is kind of a half a mile around the city limits or Shannon, were you referring to in general all the way around the entire city limits or were you, were you thinking specifically south of town? What were you thinking? I was just opening the discussion that you, I mean, I agree with your um, on discussing Highway 89 South. Okay. Um, I, I'd like to discuss the area um, northeast of town around Green Acres and, and kind of the area that has not been at annexed in that area I don't I, I don't think it personally needs to be in this pastoral and and agricultural because I think it's already been infilled um, and I think maybe there's other members that might look at other other aspects that are you know adjacent to the city boundaries can I uh, make a point of order here mm -hmm. um, you all just voted on the whole area of, um, that's labeled very low density residential. At this point where you're, that is not open for rediscussion, we're only gonna be talking about the areas that are not labeled that uh, since that vote passed unanimously uh, with that entire area changed. So in of order, we can't carve out some on that now. I mean, what, what would keep us from making a motion to, I guess, a motion for exceptions if we wanted to do that? Well, you all just approved a motion to change that entire area to pastoral and open space. Mm -hmm. Right. Except for the yellow, though. I mean, there Except is the yellow. Still... Correct. So that's where you guys are talking about, though, right? If we're looking south on oh. 89... There for is, that one, yeah, but Shannon's looking at more of kind of where that yellow bubble is up in the north. The Green area, Acres, north yeah. of Green Acres. Okay, but we changed that already from medium density to very low density, and then we just changed it again no. to pastoral. No, that was within, so Green Acres itself was inside the city limits. I think, Shannon, you're referring to outside the city limits, that area northeast of Green Acres then, is that right? Yeah, east of Green North Acres, west. west of Green Acres, south of Green Acres. That's 
Um, that's the area that I was talking about. Yeah, that I, I see as being tan in exhibit 2.8. Mm -hmm. I have an older map that shows, I must have an older map that shows just north of the park and open space, north of the river east of the green acres is still being yellow, but that is not what I see on the screen. No. Well, could we start at least by discussing the Highway 89 South Bend first, because it is yellow? and um, dealing with that and then seeing if we have some ideas on how to handle the Green Acres issue. Sure, go ahead, yeah. Stacey. What do you want to talk about with South Asian? Uh, um, well, I would like to talk about how we're planning on um, dealing with a future growth in that specific area. Um, I guess my concerns are Right now, if you've been down there, you've seen the Eagles landing um, more, and that's supposedly from high density. And uh, on the map on here, it doesn't even show that it's high density versus medium density. Um, and I believe that there was some expansion of that area, or this is showing the expansion of that area to be higher density, which from what we've been hearing is exactly the opposite of what we have uh, wanted it to be. It's already in, in the east side of 89, it's already broken into five acre plots and kind of a hodgepodge, I guess, of different things. So I don't know how that impacts how you can change things but what I don't want to see, and I don't think other people want to see is that just become full of apartment complexes or uh, tons of housing. So um, is there a way to preserve it as is and as five, five acre plots of land or I don't know, I'm open for discussion or insights. Casey, so yeah. clarify again exactly where you're looking at. I'm looking so I'll just make sure I know exactly where you're looking at. Yeah, I'm looking at um, basically from where the intersection of Highway I-90 and 89 South mm -hmm. to the east of that or to the west of that is all yellow, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. And then all, and that goes all the way down to Shamrock Lane. That is uh, the current. Uh, okay current designation on this map. And that means it goes beyond Murdoch's, it goes beyond uh, all the propane companies. Shamrock Lane is like one of the last major roads that goes into what is known as the five acre tracks. So oh, this is Shannon. Did. No, I'm sorry. This, this is Shannon. I mean, when I look at the exhibit 2.1 and I look at the magnitude of septic permits that's in that area that's yellow, I, I'm, I'm curious if what's already existing there doesn't meet the medium density residential. So are we really even changing it from what's there based on at least my interpretation of 2.1? <laughs> Well, then how did those apartment complexes get built? Because that certainly isn't medium density. Well, they're in the city limits. <laughs> There's a little, it doesn't show it on that map that it's in the city limits. So that's where I'm confused. South of the interstate, Albertsons is in the city limits. Yep. yep. And what, all of that. Willow Drive. Willow Drive is the quasi city boundary, but it is annexed uh, up near Love's Lane, farther to the west, that to include the Eagles Landing development. All right. There's so one of the maps in the in that might yeah. Here we go. Oh, yeah. It was in the memo. 
no, I've got, I've got that map. I, I'm just, <coughs> um, okay. But the city limits do not go um, all the way over to Canyon View Drive. Is that correct? They do they not. They'd be, they'd be in the ET or the future land right. use map, right? Right. So, so what's to prevent anybody in to the west of the city limits building a uh, apartment complex or uh, you know a higher density building? They'd have to be annexed and go through subdivision review. Mind if I jump in quickly? Okay. Please. So if you look at page 101, which I provided in your memo, uh, medium density is defined as medium dense, med the medium residential land use designation provides for single family detached and attached dwellings. The density range is 10 to 19 dwelling units per acre. So it's pretty clear on the thing, single family uh, aspect of that. And who, hand, who oversees um, anybody who does decide to build something and doesn't follow anything? It's just in the county and they if they build it and nobody notices, then it happens? Uh, that's basically how unregulated land works at this point. Be a pretty big septic tank. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Um, I, I, I just am skeptical that, that we're gonna be able to con contain and keep that as the way the land is being used right now. But. Isn't that where that statement about must be annexed comes into play? Yes. And so that's what's helping us there, Stacy. Is my when, understanding when I, when I read that in the um, in the growth policy that that's a that's a really really important point of of the ETJ um, chapter because it basically says if there's if there is to be any subdivision then it has to go through a very involved uh, city process and so that's a that's a that's one of the toothiest points of the whole ETJ chapter. And, and I feel the same way, Tori. And I guess I'd like to just use this example we're talking about now um, for other areas of town where it seems like we already have this medium density residential going on, but yet we did just approve as a board to color those tan and, and say that they're going to be agricultural and and pastoral and I, I'm just wondering if we shouldn't discuss other areas where we have city utilities and infrastructure and we it looks like we have quite a density of septic permits that if those start to fail and the DEQ and the sanitarian feel they need to connect to city services and sign a waiver of annexation where we're going to be growing in those areas on a lot by lot basis. So do we and want to look at them differently than just pastoral and, and agricultural? I, I think that that's, that's fair. And I think that there's been a tendency on the board so far to think about our visioning in terms of what exists currently. And I think that, um, there are a lot of conflicting interests in the growth policy. Um, the the interest that I was advocating for and that we've heard a lot about today and so far is the interest of maintaining open space around the city. Another interest that the same people will advocate for is affordable housing and the availability of, of housing within the city. And to a certain degree, those, in, those interests are conflicting, right? Because um, and especially when we talk about not changing anything from where it is today, something if, if we're going to provide a for provide housing in general for growth or doing a growth policy, that housing has to happen somewhere. And if we want it to have to have the least impact on the surrounding land, 
it has to happen in the densest way possible. And a lot of times that includes apartment buildings, especially if we're talking about affordable housing. So, and then we have, at the same time, we also have historic neighborhoods that we don't necessarily think are the best places for high density housing. So high, high density housing or housing development in general does have to go somewhere. And Shannon, I, I respect that you, you probably have a better idea of where that is than I do, but I'm just making the point that a lot of these interests that, that we all kind of, or not all of us, but many of us hold simultaneously can also be competing. Um, so. I, I, I respect that comment very much. I just, I guess I wanna put some things in a public works perspective. So let's, let's use Printing for Less, for example. Um, and let's use the Jessen property and uh, the 15 acres that's been annexed out near that interchange. Um, so there is a 10 inch water main and a 10 inch sewer main that's been extended to PFL, paid for by PFL um, to provide additional capacity, which certainly makes that mixed use area um, a viable option from a capacity standpoint for water, sewer, and stormwater. If 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 we are if we are going to extend sewer mains to Green Acres, are are we going to extend sewer mains that only are sized to handle the capacity of Green Acres, knowing that that everything adjacent to Green Acres is pastoral and agricultural? Are we going to are we going to size our utilities for some future capacity that's at, at our current uh, city boundary interface? What we're reflecting in this map and in the language, I would argue that we would not be considering um, sizing that beyond its current need which could be short-sighted, but then it could be also strategic in thinking as well, that, that the plan is saying that the focus needs to be on infill and, it, and the focus needs to be on any development near existing roads. So there may be some sizing considerations in there, uh, but I think, I think the priority right now is trying to limit the growth within the existing city limits as much as possible, I think is what we're hearing and what this map is trying to reflect. I, and, and I'm not and saying I, that's I, right or wrong, I, but that's definitely where I, we're going. I, I respect that, Brian, but I guess I'm looking at it from a public health and safety standpoint. Sure. And when you have that many drinking water wells and septic tanks that close to the city limits, um, it does seem like a very big public health and safety issue to allow them access to connect to a city water and sewer system where. Yeah, and you're right. We might be painting ourselves in a corner where then we're annexing lot by lot and we're sizing our utilities lot by lot, which is a stupid way to plan. Are we, are we yeah. create a lot of pinch points in our infrastructure right. where, where we limit our capacity? And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just telling you that that's as, as the public works director and looking at planning documents, that's something that we have to take into consideration uh, with utilities mm -hmm. and specifically water and sewer. Isn't this just a recommendation though about how we wanna grow? So Shannon, if you faced that, if and when you as a utility department or the city faces that, could we cross that bridge when we get there? Meaning these are just recommendations. We are not policy and we are not regulatory. So, so would it actually, wouldn't you make the best decision based on what is going on at the time? Well, see, the, and I guess Matthew, I'd love your input on this, but when we do planning documents for infrastructure, um, we, cert we certainly want to base those off, off of uh, the growth policy recommendation. So um, again, if we we've already done some things like south along the 89 corridor, we're sizing the water main and sewer mains 
um, feeding even Murdoch's down to um, Travertine, that those were sized based on the previous growth policy of, of saying that the, the town could grow to Guthrie Lane. And, and I think this, this map still reflects that there is mixed use down to that location. So I think, um, you know, we've covered our basis in that aspect, but knowing that we just recently annexed Green Acres and we have a sewer main uh, and a water system in that area that we're gonna be planning to design and, and upgrade. Um, what I'm getting is, is we, do, we, do not for, we do not need to include expansion of the city on three sides or all four sides of Green Acres, even though there is some area between Green Acres and the city that's still in the county based on this map 2.8. And I think it makes, I think it, the, the case you're making, um, Shannon, is that Green Acres was kind of out by itself. And by annexing it into the city, you're just trying to infill from the existing city to Green Acres. Um, and perhaps in your original plan, you thought it would be a little bit larger than what we're saying now to the west and to the east of Green Acres. Uh, but I think what the public has been saying is that they don't want further outward growth beyond Green Acres. But I, I think that at, from a public works perspective, you would want to put in adequate piping to meet the infill that's gonna happen between Green Acres and the city limits, which mm -hmm. potentially could, could include across the street from Green Acres. I mean. Yeah, and I, I guess that's, 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 that's the one area that I, I just, because of the way the city has annexed Brookstone and now Green Acres, there's still quite a bit of county the, um, between that location and uh, say Bennett Street. But I, and, and I, I, dis I guess I, I personally disagree and I'm, this is just one opinion that that area shouldn't be uh, labeled as pastoral and open space um, or agricultural because it, it, it's, it's already not. It's, there's homes getting built out there as we speak. Um, and uh, none of those homes are connected to city services or have been annexed into the city um, yet. And again, I'm just wondering, does it, how much does it matter in the, in the big picture, visioning picture? I, I guess I just, I'm curious about that piece, Shannon, is, is we voted on it. We, we did that because of the, uh, of sort of what we're hearing from the community. If this is already currently happening and uh, there are houses and such, and you will be putting in that additional infrastructure, wouldn't you do it to, to fit what's already happening? And it doesn't matter whether we, re, we, we, we designate it as something different. That's just kind of what I'm thinking. Hi, Bruce. And, How are you doing? Oh, could you mute, please, Patricia? We see we see yeah. your microphone is off, and we can hear you. <laughs> wow! And you know, I also don't know. I mean, would that be enough? I I I guess I just question. We made a motion. I think I can mute her. Actually, hold on. Oh no! Yeah, there she yeah. is. Um. <laughs> uh, we made the motion. It's almost as if if we are going to are, are we making a motion on top of a motion? Uh, I don't know. I think you would have to make an additional motion to exclude a certain area if you so chose to exclude a certain area from the pastoral land that we already approved. So if you wanted to say like if Shannon wanted to make a motion to that effect, he certainly could, and we could discuss it. I guess in the future, um, if you would like to not include the whole motion, amendments, a motion to amend the motion should be made at the time of the motion before it is voted upon. 
once you vote yay on an on a motion, um, basically that shows that you are agreeing with that motion in its totality. Um, so just moving forward, we should have right. amendments to motions if we want to change them. <laughs> anyone can make those amendments and anyone can second them. And then, then those would be voted upon. And if they pass, they would move forward and become part of the motion. And if they failed, we would go back to the original motion uh, just for future uh, right. as we work our way through this. I think we did not discuss that enough uh, these individual cases when we were in the process of making that overall motion. And, and, and I'll, I'll apologize. I mean, I, I thought when Matthew said, you know, we needed a second and then we could open it back up to discussion. I, I generally, I mean, I agree with the pastoral and, and agricultural land. I guess the question I, I pose to the other board members is, um, we have the air area that uh, Stacy talked about that's in the five acre tract and area that's yellow. We have the whole voyage area that's mixed use, but we have, and, and we have the south side of town along the river corridor, which I agree as being park and open and natural areas. But uh, are we saying that, that everything on the north side of town um, outside of current city limits is is agricultural and pastoral that's what we're saying that's what we voted unless on. you yeah. want to make a unless you want to make an amendment to the motion just to be clear you can't amend a motion once it passes so you're gonna to have to make a completely oh. different motion now and really we should have amended the motion before the vote was taken um, just okay. for the future <laughs> and another Thing for future, we should always allow a discussion before we hold a vote on any motion we oh. have. Uh, just a, some points of uh, administration here. Okay. okay, so moving forward, our options are to discuss. It sounds like we have made a motion and we are moving forward. So, do we have other discussion points on the ETJ? Uh -huh. So, our Go ahead, Taya. Oh, I was just gonna follow up to Stacy's um, question about the, the 89 South Corridor. Um, why was it designated medium density along that along the river? Between the highway and the river? I believe it's because of basically the existing parcel division um, along that area. You can kind of see it there. However, that is an area that is frequently flooded in high water and uh, the housing, the residence, residential properties that are on there uh, in high water times oftentimes get flooded. So it's actually something that I think should be changed to agricultural, very low density or something that is not uh, for future development or open space. I, I do want to have a very low density residential because they're like their acre lots, right? So with medium density residential, we would be how many how many homes per acre, Matthew? Two. Three to nineteen. Whoa. Uh nope, ten to nineteen, I'm sorry. I, I do wonder about reclassifying that as very low density. And what section are you referring to here, specifically uh, from which roads? Sorry, the from Shamrock, um, Shamrock Lane down. I, let's see. I don't or, know. Which side of the road are you on? The east side of the, basically that um, area between the river, the east of 89. Right. Uh, and west of the river. It, kind of south of, uh, yeah. The yellow east of 89 west of the river that little strip right in there yep mm -hmm. i think that sounds reasonable taya so so i will make a motion to modify the map uh to change it from very, or sorry, medium density residential to very low density residential in the area 
east of 89, west of the Yellowstone. I'll, I'll second. second. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Tori seconds. Any discussion on that? Um, where was it starting just to, to the, the northern tip of that is from where? From the red part, the community commercial, strong lane, all the way down to the end of the ETGA, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, that whole yellow area. So that's strong lane right underneath the 89 sign down to the tip of the border of the ETJ. Okay. Any other discussion? Oh. Okay, hearing none, we're gonna vote. Uh, Taya. Four. Tori. Four. Shannon. Four. Stacy. Four. Brian. Four. Jesse is also for the motion passes. Okay. And what you don't want to. I'm sorry, what, Stacey? Um, well, we did have some public discussion on the mixed use designation for the voyage land. Okay. And I'd like to see if there was any discussion on um, any comments on that area, whether it should, should be kept as that or um, I mean, right now you have the property owner or part one of the property owners who says he's not going to ever change it to anything else. So is that um, by having a mixed use designation over the entire area, and I'm not sure we can see exactly where the property parcel is on that. Can we somewhere on one of the maps? Let me think, see. Where just the void uh, property is? Uh-huh. West. Enter. Um, this, uh, there is one of these maps I think might include it. Or maybe it doesn't go far enough out. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yep. These aren't numbered, let's see. It's page 11 on when you scroll through the, the uh, memo. Document. It's the parcel land. So you have to assume that part of that is the Voyage Ranch maybe in the blue. And then the gray is my PSL maybe. Well, PFL would be in the light purple, oh. I think, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct, Matthew? That's correct. Uh, let me see. I think oh, this PF, is the PFL's the gray. Yeah. yeah. I call it call it light purple, but gray, light purple, one of the two. Um and the voyage is all in the bluish color. A piece of it. Matthew just outlined it, I think. Oh. Do it again, Matthew. I wasn't looking there. Oops, you'll see it on screen here. It's the area outlined in blue, I believe, is the voyage property. I don't know if their property extends further to the south as well. Uh, this property up here is uh, where the uh, auto junkyard is uh, you have the truck stop and you have PFL um, right here and Matthew okay they they do they do own farther to the east into town into that other blue yep maybe and and I'll take a low-hanging fruit I think everything from that line that Matthew just drew to Park Street should be um put under low density residential like it is in the five acre tracks because <laughs> it's already more or less built out that way. <laughs> uh, so I, I mentioned before um, our competing interests of preserving, um, pr preserving 
land for ecological reasons, for aesthetic reasons, uh, and then the need to not necessarily facilitate, but allow for growth when, when the market so dictates. Um, and from a land use and transportation perspective, um, and I think also kind of balancing some of those ecological constraints, that area seems like, to me, like a pretty good place um, for some of that latent growth to go, again, if the market so dictates. So I think I think I would I I, I would just disagree, Shannon, that I, that um, that area should be should remain at its current density. I think that's an area that could, um, for a lot of reasons, um, could accommodate some of the infill development that we're you know we're saying we're going to avoid sprawl by facilitating infill. Uh, that infill has to happen somewhere, and to me, that seems like a a reasonable place for that to happen. So, Tori, just so I'm clear, I if the area directly south of I-90 is yellow, and it's uh, you're disagreeing that the area just north of Park Street that shown on 2.8 is all shown in pink as mixed use, but it's already built out. So I, I think so I think that mixed use. Um, is a de designation that could facilitate infill denser development in that in that pink area. I don't see how mixed use can in would create infill when it's residential. Uh, you Already. have a railroad track that goes you have to cross to get into that area on the the part bordering Park Street. There's a railroad track. So mixed use allows for for residential, commercial, um, it, it allows for basically all kinds of, of uh, urban land uses, sometimes within the same parcel, uh, sometimes between parcels. And what mixed use does is it does not say that a specific area needs to be only residential or only commercial, it allows for both. Um, and mixed use is great in terms of a land use and, and transportation perspective because it it allows for multiple land uses within close proximity, which, which requires that, or does not require that at people within that area travel to other areas to fulfill their, their daily needs. Um, and so, uh, so I see that area, especially because it doesn't, in, in my perspective, and uh, you know, I, I don't know as much about the region as, as anybody on the planning board. Um, I think that that area is not as ecologically important as the periphery of Livingston. And so I think that that could be a potential area for infill for higher density development. Um, and basically, if we're going to avoid sprawl, as we keep hearing about and talking about, density has to happen somewhere. and residential commercial development has to happen somewhere. Um, and to me, that seems like a logical place for it. Is there any opportunity for public comment? Not right now, Patricia, I'm sorry. You know, so, my, th my well, thought on so that I is you could shrink it because I know the there has been comment about that being the pronghorn migratory route. And then we've also talked about putting the overpass slash underpass somewhere in that area. Um, and then we've also heard public comment, not from the owner that I've heard, but from others that the Jessens don't want to develop that. So that was the big chunk that Matthew just parsed out. You know, we could shrink it a little bit um, and maybe uh, eliminate that Jessen property I don't know if that makes sense to do so, but we could consider that. Is it, are you referring to Justin property? Is the voyage the property? Voyage. I'm sorry, the voyage property. Okay. Or uh, I don't know if the property owner has. I haven't heard. You know, I don't know how you consider that. May I just uh, make so, so Tori. I I really appreciate your insight, and matter of fact, I I misspoke. Um, I, I wasn't 
I shouldn't have referred to it as, as a residential area. I mean, it is, and I agree, it is adjacent to Park Street. And I, I agree 100% about the transportation and the benefits of that. So does, does keeping that mixed use, in your opinion, um, versus looking at it maybe like the area down by where McDonald's is that looks like it's community commercial, at least along that corridor, kind of like our highway commercial in the city limits. Um, do you see any benefit of differentiating between mixed use and the neighborhood commercial or community commercial that's par that's adjacent to Park Street? I, I do. Uh, from and and this is this is typically in like a more urban context, um, but mixed use often means having multiple uses within the same parcel. So envision, basically envision, uh, envision Main Street where there's residential above commercial in the same, in the same building. Um, when I think of community commercial, uh, I think of strip development, strip mall development, and that's not mixed use. And I think that we've heard from the public that they don't, and I think that there's, there's broadly a consensus in planning that that uh, strip development is not the most efficient way to uh, to segregate land uses, but mixed use allows basically down Main Street you could be considered mixed use, um, and so uh, mixed use to me means something very different from uh, community commercial. So is there a possibility of taking the voyage land and at this juncture in time saying that it's, it would be considered a natural area uh, to preserve uh, uh, for, for now? I mean, who knows in 20 years what may happen, but for now, rather than designate it as mixed use and break off the the Eastern portion as, or keep it as a mixed use and the PFL as mixed use um, and, and can we do that? My question about that is we were gonna, there was a lot of discussion on the overpass and uh, I, I thought maybe many people were really pro star edition um, is where they wanted that, would that land on voyage property or would that be east of it? I think east. you're confusing the voyage property with the Jessen property. The uh, overpass was proposed for the Jessen property area. Basically where put, the corner of the road is there. Could you put your arrow on where the Jessen property is? Well, please? that's where the city proposed it, but I think the community pushed back a little bit on that, Matthew, because they didn't want they didn't want it to go that far out. Yeah, no, I think the city wanted. So originally the city had purchased that property in the star edition where that, where the, where the road bends, uh, front street oh. bends to star edition. And that's where the, that a lot of public comment mentioned that they wanted the overpass underpass there, not out on the Jessen property because of, of all the reasons that we're discussing because it's drying, it's sprawl. <coughs> and so if we, eliminate the voyage property from mixed use and we as a community want to put the overpass at star edition is that going to hinder that if we take it out of mixed use okay no then okay good all right well then i'll for for time's sake i'll just make a motion and still discuss it to remove the voyage property from the mixed use of that parcel of land. Um, I don't know. You know where it is, Matthew, in the triangle there. Is that is that is that a close enough description? You drew it. Oops. Um, it's a little bit. So let me just pull up the map quickly here, uh, just so I know what uh, area you're talking about, so I can relay it. Are we simply talking about this area right here? Or do we wanna move 
the whole area basically near PFL or and are we including this residential commercial okay area so there? the okay good point because the voyage you said the the um car place is that other script rectangle next to PFL and um right that's the okay so I was just referring to the voyage land okay and we'll leave it at that so the rest the other part blue portion would be still considered mixed use potentially so what's in blue now would be mixed use potentially is what you're saying the little tiny square next to the gray pfl would still be mixed use plus the residential areas um on park street and up to the y anybody want to second that i'll second Any more discussion on that? Um, just one point. I, I understand that the property owner has no intent to sell at this present time. I think I, I agree if there's ever a place to do infill, that place is the best place to do it. And we can't, just like all this property we're looking at, we don't know what the intent of the property owner is. They could be saying one thing and doing something different. I believe them in this case, but I don't think, I'm not sure that I, three years from now, a lot of things could happen. So I think that's the best place possible to do some infill. So um, I'm planning on voting against it. I'll just say that. Me too. I agree, I agree with, with Brian and Tori's point, I do think. Um, infill wise it, it does make sense and I'll be voting against. Yes, I don't, I, I just don't see it as a infill for mixed use to that degree uh, for that much land. I see it more for residential um, than for commercial. So that's my hesitation to have it be the entire area be mixed use. Does Quick question, does mixed use prevent it from being residential? Absolutely no. not. No, it doesn't. But there is there is nothing that says how, what percentage is going to be residential or what percentage is going to be business, right? It, the market is what, with, with, with mixed use, the market will say which, what percentage goes to what. And I'll just throw in there, it's an absolutely beautiful piece of property, absolutely gorgeous piece of property untouched at the moment. And so I would love to see that stay open space personally. Um, but, and, and so that's kind of why I seconded that motion. Okay, any more discussion before we vote? Okay. Stacey made the motion, Jesse seconded, and here we go. Taya. Against. Uh, Tori. Against. Shannon. Against. Brian. Against. Uh, Stacy. Four. And Jesse's four, but the motion does not pass. Okay. Moving on. Is there any other discussion in the ETJ? I have. I have one more uh, discussion point about the map. Um, yep. The. The median density residential north of 90 along the river is, I mean, in, in an aerial shot, it's it's in it's in the floodplain. There's there's channels there, um, so I would uh, recommend changing that to to very low density residential. I'm sorry, which area are you? Can you draw it, Matthew? Do you know where are we talking about? Oh, I didn't see it. Where Where are you pointing? I think she's talking about 9th Street Island, which we got a public comment on. Yep. Oh, good. She is. Okay. 
Okay, so oh, okay. you were thinking about changing that to very low density residential? That or, well, yeah, because I, th I think there are, uh, yes, so very low density residential. Okay, and the comment was north of I-90 is yellow and south of I-90 is green. So um, is there a reason why we would not keep it do we want more building on 9th Street Island or would we turn it green? Can you turn it green? I believe it's owned property that is owned. But that doesn't, that the fact that that property is owned doesn't mean that our vision, uh, you know, our vision shouldn't be constrained by property ownership. Um, okay. It shouldn't be constrained by what people have promised and and so on. Our What, what we're visioning is it's, it's not constrained by regulatory process. So, um, and I, I'm, I'm, I would be happy to vote for low density residential there because that exists. Um, and so that doesn't, that doesn't bother me, but I also would be more eager to vote for uh, open space or, or whatever we want to call it. Thanks for the clarification, Tori. Then I would, yeah, I would like to designate it open space. Okay. Right, Anybody want to throw that out oh. there? Open oh. space versus um, low, very low very, density. Very low residential. density because there's already residential there. I mean, you're. How so, does that... so how does that work? I yeah. mean, you know, you have, you have, let's say twenty. I don't know if there's twenty people out there on that island. There might not even be that many. Um, I don't see how you can designate it as a future land use map with it that way. I think you can only reduce the density for the future, but I don't think you can turn it into open space. Matthew, clarification, please. Uh, you can, as Tori has noted, it's what the vision is. So you can do whatever you think is right. Um, it's Again, it's non-regulatory. So it's not like if the growth policy passes, all of a sudden, all those properties are open space. They remain as they are. Um, it's, a, it's a guide, it's a visioning document for what we want to see in the area in the future. Um, and as I noted in my memo, it's a broad brush description. Um, so just because certain areas are labeled certain things doesn't mean that's necessarily what they're going to be in the future as well. Um, so you can certainly do it. Um, you know, you noted there are residential properties there. So whether or not you want to do that is the question uh, at this point before you. Well, I think that, that it should remain um, very low density at the, at the uh, least. I don't know what, what it's, what is it currently right now in the current growth policy? What's it labeled as? It's is yellow, it so it's medium density residential. On the north side, on the south side, it's green. So we could turn it brown, right? Which was very low density, or we could turn it green. And so as, as I've been saying, we're, we're, we're not constrained by what's there and we're not constrained, we're not making regulations of what even can be there. We're, we're, what we're saying is this is what our, this is our vision. And in being, let's say, you could even call our vision an exaggeration because there's already, there's, there's already those existing uses in that place. But that exaggeration is telling the actual decision makers, the city council members and, and the, the zoning, zoning commission of what our intent is, of what our vision is. And so I think that I think that green is closer aligned with what our intent and our vision is, even though that's not necessarily what is on the ground. And by designating it green, we're not taking away any property rights from the people who already own residential properties there. We're just saying for and we can even you could even think of it this way. We're saying if you're considering places like this in the future, this is how we see that. Right. If you're considering what to do, how to zone a place like this in the future. This is how we see that being zoned, but we're not zoning it. We're not taking away any property rights. We're just saying this is our vision. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for the clarification. I, I still think that it should have some um, 
ability to have housing on it. So I wouldn't, wouldn't vote for an open space designation. Okay. I'll, I'll move. I'll Go move. ahead, Taya. Is it okay to make a motion? Yes, please. Okay. Um, I'll move that that area is designated natural space. Oh, shoot. I'll second. Any further discussion on that? Okay, uh, let's vote. Taya? Four. Stacy? No. Uh, Tori? Four. Shannon? No. Brian? No. Uh, uh, Jesse is a yes. So we are tied on that motion. Uh, motion does not pass because we don't have a majority yes. Okay, motion does not pass. Um, I'll make a motion. Try okay. again. Well, I'll, tr I'll just try again. Um, I make a motion to designate that space as very low density residential. We'll so I have a Taya seconds. Okay, any discussion? All right, let's vote. Taya? Four. Tori? Four. Shannon? Four. Brian? Four. Stacy? Four. And Jesse, I'm against. But the motion passes. So perfect. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Any other discussion on the ETJ? Yes, more. Madam Chair. Yes. This Shannon. is Shannon. I, I'd, I'd like to pan into that area near Green Acres. Okay. If at all possible. Are you seeing what you wanted to see? Yeah. And I, I'd like to make a motion that if you took the west boundary of Green Acres and went south to the city limits and the north boundary and went uh, east um, to the end of Arbor Drive, south to the city limits, that we make that area um, either low or medium density residential. And I'm open to suggestions on if anybody agrees with that, what, what it would be classified at, but. I'll, I'll second it just so that we can have discussion. Um, could you draw that again, Matthew? I didn't quite see the boundaries. Oh, here we go. In it. So Shannon, were you saying it would go left to Green Acres, left west boundary is Pine Street maybe? Okay, yeah, that street down to Wineglass Lane or? Yep, correct. Oh, down, down there and over filling in, okay. As to the city limits. Can you just describe that again for everyone and me. So <laughs> again, um, I'm gonna say that is Tana Lane, right? The west boundary has Tana Lane. Mm -hmm. So south down to Wineglass Lane. And the north boundary, so it would be Willow Street over to Old Clay Park Road, down to Arbor Drive, to the river, down to the city property at the transfer station. And then down Garnier all the way to um, Dalton, maybe? Or well, back to the Miller. basically the point of return on wine glass, all that area that's out of the 
currently out of the city limits. Okay. And what okay. did you want to make it, Shannon? Medium density? Well, I, I, I don't know the, I want it to just be based on, I guess, how, uh, what we feel Green Acres is. For the, for the sake of this guy, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I don't know if that would be classified as medium density residential. Um, <laughs> what about mixed use? That's one no. thing that I was thinking about, Jesse, or just I'll throw that up, up for discussion. You know, in some of the comments that we've received, public comments, there's been a lot of discussion about trying to uh, push some, um, you know, shopping, some, some uh, you know, sh either shop stores up on the northern side of town, some conveniences there so that people don't have to cross the tracks so that they can go maybe a restaurant, maybe a, a, a supermarket, stuff like that. So that would probably be a good place to have that. Um, so mixed use would allow for that. So I think I would lean more toward that versus just essentially making that all one large subdivision, which is what it would be if we zoned it the same way as, again, not that we're zoning here, but if, if we recommended that it had the same features as Green Acres. Mm -hmm. I, I would oh. probably agree with Brian. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, I think we've, I think today, tonight, we've kind of identified two places where we see there feasibly and responsibly being growth in, in Livingston, right? And uh, in my opinion, <laughs> way that you do responsible growth anywhere is with mixed use that allows for residents daily needs to be accomplished in in walking distance um, and people are not likely to walk from that area to to downtown to town and country or or wherever but if you if you allow for mixed use and then again as I, I keep making this point the market's going to dictate what actually gets gets built there it, it's not our, we're not, we're not prescribing any kind of development. We're just allowing for what the, the market um, calls for. And um, so, but, but anyway, I, I, allowing for a variety of uses in the places that we have decided are reasonable and responsible areas to grow in Livingston, I think is the most prudent choice for the board to make. Mm -hmm. We, we already did create mixed use from Al Spa down to East Gallatin as part of within the city limit. So that was so already. I, I, it, Madam it Chair, does, I yeah. guess um, I, my motion would be to, to take the area that I defined and, and um, label it mixed use. Great. Stacey, do you still second? Well, yeah, wait a minute. We are, didn't we already have a first and a second out there? We did. Stacy was the second. I just was confirming. I, but but uh, J uh, Shannon added that it would be designated mixed use. So, so make well, a, motion, a motion to amend. Right. Uh, yes. Motion. I'll there make a go. motion to amend Shannon's motion, dedicating the geographic area that he outlined as mixed use as opposed to medium density residential. I second. Just for clarification, oh. just I mm -hmm. still have no idea what area you're talking about. Um, there were a lot of road names thrown out there and from here to here to here to here to here. Can we get a better definition of that area so I can make sure Could we you, get it right? Why uh, don't you pull, pull up the map that shows the Northeast one? It's uh, page 17 in your on your yeah. packet. There you go. And then shrink it in and you'll be able to see maybe where he was talking about. What I heard, it is from Willow to Old Clyde Park Road, which is right here, which runs at a diagonal to Arbor Drive, which runs parallel and perpendicular to Old Clyde Park Road to the river. And then the rest of the area, I think, but I'm not sure I'm translating. Are we doing something like this? I'm not quite sure if I'm translating that right. And then all the way down to the end of the city property, basically like that. Is that what we're talking about? 
So Matthew, yeah. The basically the north boundary would be Willow, um, yeah. down to Arbor Drive, crossing Garnier to Arbor Drive to to the river. South, all the way to Bennett Street, over to the Wine Glass Court, up to Tana Lane, and back to Willow. So, I think where I'm struggling is those are two areas that are not. There's city in between those two areas. Um, so basically, what I'm hearing is this to the river, all the way down. Bennett Street, just taking in all this area that's not in the city right now. Uh, I just lost my draw tool again. Something like that. And then I don't know. Do you want the entirety of Tana or Tana Lane in to the end? So it runs out to the northwest there. Or are we just looking at where it intersects oh. with the city boundary? Uh Tana Lane actually is a north-south road, so I'm not sure what is going okay, so on there, but that's it's that and, it, and draw that down to wine, wine Glass Lane. Yes. Wine Glass is in this, so basically following yep. the city limits there, um, yep. where there's this hole here, basically. Yep. Right. Thank you. But you also One. have that whole, uh, hole just south of Llama Lane as well that I is see. not in the city. One point of clarification on your drawing. No, we have it going all the way to the river and everywhere else along the river, we have been very careful as far as the density goes there. So do we want to reconsider how far, I guess, south, I'm kind of a little disoriented here, um, how do far close early? to the river we go so that we don't, We I don't think we want mixed use along the river. We don't want to see a Hilton be put up on the along the river's edge. I, I agree with you again, Brian. I agree as well. Hefferlin Avenue, over to Hefferlin Avenue. Yeah, perfect. The second road in, because the first one is Old Clyde Park Road and the sign doesn't seem like it's there, but goes down a little further, uh, go towards the river to the road that's Hefferlin Avenue there. That, that's Hefferlin. I believe. Either that or it's Grandview Boulevard. What, whatever that dark whatever blue that thing one is, is. That's, that's the boundary, yeah. we'll call that Blue Street. That, yeah. Does that work for you, Shannon? Yes. Have we, we have amended the motion? Amendment. Can we have an amendment to the motion that was made? I, I amend my right. second motion, which realigns to the boundaries that we've just drawn. Do we have a second? I'll, just Brian, I'll, I'll second. second that. Brian is seconding. Do we have any other conversation about this? Okay, let's vote. Taya. Four. Stacy. Four. Tori. Four. Shannon. Four. Brian. Four. And Jesse is four. Okay, motion passes. So we didn't really vote on all the amendments, Jesse. So that was actually a vote on the amendments for including the exact boundaries. And I think now we have to vote on everything. Right, Matthew? So by approving the amendment that included the changing it to mixed use, so the original motion was covered in that. So you should okay. be fine. Okay. Perfect. Just want to make sure we were following Robert's rules of order. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, any other discussion topics on the ETJ? I think Taya had some. Yeah, Go ahead, Taya. It's a, it's a, a wording point. Um, I know there's been com a public comment about, ref you know, um, in our vision, including, we, we reference wildlife habitat, as well as including migratory paths. So I think an appropriate place might be on page 42 under objective 4.3, manage and preserve natural resources, strategy 4.3.3, where it references wildlife habit, habitat, we say, including migratory paths. Okay, do you guys see that page 42, strategy 4.3.3? 
Is there a motion? I'm, I motion to- And to get there, just a second. <laughs> okay. Would you repeat that again, Taya? Um, I motion to include uh, migratory paths under strategy 4.3.3. Does Brian, I'll second that. Any discussion? Hearing none, we're gonna vote. Taya? Four. Tori? Four. Stacy? Four. Brian? Four. Shannon? Is on mute. Four. Jesse, four. Motion passes. Okay. Any other discussion on the ETJ? I do. Okay. Um, I was I was wondering on the same page, 42, uh, under strategy 4.11, access, access all new development to ensure there is least environmental impact. Matthew, does that include um, the use of floodway and floodplain data? The strategy is pretty vague, um, so it not specifically, no, but it, I mean, environmental impact, that would be part of it, but if you want to specifically uh, reference that, that would need to be made in a motion. Well, I'd like to make a motion to um, use floodway and floodplain data where applicable um, primarily because we have so many areas of uh, water and building that has been done in future. Okay, Stacey, Anybody how would that read? You're, you're making a motion, how do you want it to read? Um, to uh, use floodway and floodplain data where applicable when assessing new development Is that changing strategy 4.1.1? It's actually adding to it. Okay. So assess all new development to assure there is least environmental impact, including floodway and floodplain data, data where applicable? Right. Perfect. Anyone want to second that? I second that. Taya, anybody have any discussion on that one? Um, this is Shannon. Go ahead, um, Shannon. Could I amend it to just say um, assess all new development to ensure there is at least there is least environmental impact and follow all floodplain guidelines? Would that does that work for everybody? Well, there's floodway and floodplain, and they're two distinctly different things, is my understanding, and. It's changes every year, it seems. So that was kind of why I kept it to two different ones, but. Could you say that Shannon in this, just including both? I, I, I think so. I, I, I feel like floodplain guidelines includes all the regulations that apply to the floodplain, but that's, that's just been my experience. So maybe it reads, Stacy, assess all new development to ensure there is least environmental impact according to, sorry, Shannon, floodway and floodplain. What was the word you used? Data. Re guidelines. Regulations. Guidelines. Our guidelines. regulations, yeah. You probably want including, not you don't want you don't want that whole thing just to be stressed on the right. On right. The floodplain. You want, right. Okay, so I'm gonna try it one more time. Assess all new development to ensure there is least environmental impact, including floodway and floodplain guidelines where applicable. Right. Since we have modified Stacy's original motion, can we just verify that Stacy is okay with that modification or I am that? I am okay with the modification. Does uh, Taya, did you second that? Did I somebody did. second that? Okay. Let's vote. Stacy. Oh. oh, pro. Pro. Tori. Oh. Taya. Four. Brian. Four. Shannon. Four. Jesse is four. 
motion passes. We're losing it. Okay. <laughs> right. I'm sorry. I have I have another one. Oh, good. What? What <laughs> is more it? do you have, Stacy? <laughs> I have a lot. <laughs> um, this has to do with view space. And I don't know, again, if this is um, anything that should be in the goals and objectives, but one of the things that we keep talking about is the characteristics of the town and the, the views are cru crucial to our community. And I, I don't see anything uh, in the ETJ as well as in the, in the um, city growth policy that addresses uh, uh, to protect our view space. And I'm not exactly sure how to word that, but I do think it's an important factor. Do you think that would be more in chapter four, natural resources when we get there? I mean, we're, I, I don't know I don't if that fits know. in That's, the ETJ. I don't, I don't know if that fits in the ETJ. It, it, I'm, I'm not sure. I didn't know because of uh, protected view spaces you could have in areas south of 89, you could have in the mixed use development, you could have something come up that is not protecting our view space. You so, could mention that though, can't you, Stacy? In the in um, uh, the land use section of the growth policy, you can reference that to include the ETJ, can you not? And it would cover it? Yeah, yeah, we can do okay. it that way. Okay. okay. Um, do you mind if we do that, Stacy, and cover it next no, time? No, that's fine, that's okay. fine. I didn't know exactly. I just didn't. I wanted it covered um, because I thought it was important. Um, Shannon, I have a question for you on page the next page 43 when it says pave and widen unpaved roads to improve access and safety for all users. In particular, when I think of the five acre tracks or any of the other developments does um, that automatically include widening it to city standards or is it just paving or paving it, but it doesn't necessarily widen it. Cause you know, like in five acre tracks we have, I was on it today and I about got hit because the road is so narrow and there's so much more traffic. So do we need to include the word widen for a frame of reference? Uh, I, I, I would agree with that, especially as it applies to the ET, ETJ. Um, definitely the county road right of ways are, are different and smaller than most city right of ways. So could, could we just say on strategy 5.3.1 on page 43, pave and and insert and widen unpaved roads. Do we need to say to what standards or whatever? But no, Matthew just say pave and widen is, is sufficient. So if, if I can add my two cents here, I, sure. I kind of, I, I glossed over that. Um, but uh, in land use and transportation theory, there's a, there's a, a theory called induced development. Right. Um, and and actually, my, my with my understanding of induced development, paving and widening roads will facilitate development along that road because it improves accessibility. And accessibility um, is a factor in land evaluate in land valuation. Um, so, if if I were to I mean, now that you bring it up, I would actually consider. A motion to just eliminate strategy 5.3.1 altogether because I think it actually contradicts that rule or that strategy that we talked about earlier of focusing development on existing uh, infrastructure. But um, I, I think it's a safety hazard right now. Um, it, uh, it's not sustaining the growth and, and you put in, for instance, that it's adjacent to the city and you have now put in, I don't know, probably a hundred apartments and the road um, can't sustain that. The, the existing mm -hmm. narrow roads cannot sustain it. What, and, what, if we, what if we added something to the effect of pave and widen roads where 
current development has increased or where recent development has increased traffic. Um, basically, I, I ha promoting a policy of just ubiquitously paving, paving and widening roads will 100% facilitate sprawl. Um, and so maybe for a little bit more specific, like roads that have recently experienced increased traffic due to uh, existing development or something along those lines. Or I would agree with how about How about just something vague as far as Im improving the safety or the level of service of, of existing unpaved roads or, or, or existing roads? And if, 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 if the traffic counts and the geometry dictates that paving is a, a safety improvement, then you do that. But if it does not, then you take other measures to improve the safety. I do like having some per parameters around it because when I had read that strategy, um, because it was just so general, I also, for, for me, what jumped out is cost to, to pave, you know, unpaid roads that may not be used as much as, and, and maintain well, them. Well, and the other complaint about unpaved roads is you increase users is dust control, which also costs lots of money to do that every year <laughs> so i wonder if we then could as a compromise kind of go pave unpaved roads if traffic counts merit to improve access and safety for all users the traffic counts do that Okay. Is that your motion, Stacy? Or I'm sorry, was that a was that a question? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll make it a motion so we can have discussion. Um, I, I have heard before that to Tori's point that you build a road and it it promotes sprawl. I still think we have an issue with crappy roads in the county, but um, I'll make the motion to amend it to say pave unpaved roads if traffic counts merit it to improve access and safety for all users. Okay, do we have a second? I will second. Do we want to open it back up for discussion? This is Brian, just as I ponder through this and think about it all. Um, I'm not I'm not even sure we need, I'm not sure who mentioned that before about just striking it all together. I mean, the, the overall objective is, hey, we need safety. Um, you know, we're going to co coordinate with the county, coordinate with Department of Transportation. Um, I, I guess I, I'm not sure why, I, I'm, I'm just conflicted. I, I just don't think it's necessary to, to even have it personally. Um, I could be, could be missing something, but I just don't think there's any value added to it. I worry that that, that line in our growth policy could be used by de developers to say, if we build this out here and traffic counts increase, then, then the city will, will need to make a connection to right. the network. And uh, that's, again, that, that facilitates sprawl and that's the opposite of what we're trying to do. I, yeah, I get the point you're trying to make, Stacy. that we all want safe roads and there's some places where they're not safe today. And, and I think what we just have to do is lean on our representatives to make sure that when we identify those that we lean on them and say, look, th th these are areas that we need to. But I'm afraid of dictating or coming up with any standards. I, I, I really appreciate what's been said. I do think that we will facilitate sprawl or growth in places that we don't. People will use this against us, against our vision, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Okay, um, well, okay. Any I'll other discussion on it before we, I'm sorry. Oh, I just called for the question. 
Okay, we have a motion on the table and a second. Are we ready to vote? Okay, we're voting. Taya. Against. Tori. Against. Stacy. Um, four. Shannon. Not really. uh, four. Brian. Against. And I'm gonna be against too. So motion does not pass. This is Brian, I'll make a, I'll make ahead, a motion. Brian. I'll make a more motion to delete strategy 5.3.1. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second. Tori seconds. Do we have any discussion on this? Okay, hearing none, we're gonna vote. Taya? Four. Tori? Four. Stacy? Four. Shannon? No. Brian? Four. And I'm gonna be four as well. Okay, motion passes to strike 5.3.1. Okay. So I have one more. Okay. Okay. This is uh, on page 44, top of the page, strategy 5.4.2. Says the development of agri agritourism industries and nature nature based and agri -tour tourism industries to promote community identity and economy. Um, I I just wondered what agritourism was referencing. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, tours on farms and bringing people in uh, to. Um, highlight agriculture or grassland, ranch land in a tourism way. So you're economically sort of promoting ag by invite. So it's like if you had a dairy farm and you wanted to invite people on there to milk cows, uh, you could do that. That's agri-tourism. Um, I, you know, I personally think that would be an amazing, I, I think I, I am very partial to this uh, objective. It, it's basically, and, it's really supporting and, and featuring uh, local yeah. agriculture in our area. And, and adding to the amazing. impact of it as well. Sorry, Tori, so, what was that? I, I said, and adding to the, the regional economic impact of it as well beyond just the production of the agricultural products. Mm -hmm. So would that also include museums then as a you know, historical perspective of agriculture? It, it could, agri-tourism, uh, I, um, I don't know if it, yeah, I guess if you had a museum on an agricultural piece of land or property or some, somebody who is currently producing, I think it would be the same thing. Matthew, were you gonna clarify something in there? You just turned your microphone off. Yeah, just, I think uh, a good example of sort of a museum type agritourism would be um, someone giving tours or sh has showing off or demonstrating or allowing people per to participate in sort of historical agricultural practices, um, maybe pre-industrial agricultural practices um, or showing how uh, the we'll say original Western settlers, uh, European settlers would have uh, done agriculture back in the, in the 1800s. Okay. Or okay. Native Americans, how Native Americans grew, yeah. you know, here in our area. Okay, one more, one more. Um, page 41, um, strategy 3.1.7. Um, I was wondering if we should, should, potentially remove, develop areas to be annexed, annexed to the city to have a higher density and remove a higher density with a mix of housing types? I don't understand. Well, I, I was wondering if we should take out a higher density, um, develop areas to be annexed to the city to have a mix of housing types is what I think that it should say. Oh, I see, okay. Not a higher density. 
The only thing I get concerned on with that one, Stacy, is if you did want to put some sort of a for, uh, affordable housing unit in that had multiple apartments, which is considered high density. I, uh, but I guess you could do that with mixed use if you took the high density out. Well, and this is in the ETJ. I mean, this is where you're this not. Is, yeah, this is not to be annexed. Develop areas. Right, oh. but we're just we're just talking about how not having 20 apartment complexes, three stories high annexed into the city just because they're next to the city in the ETJ, where that to me is promoting more sprawl, more outward, more people outward instead of saying, let's build a middle use facility um, somewhere closer in town. Well, I'd make the I'd make the argument the word says higher, not high density. Um, so oh, yeah. um, I think I think again, if we as a city are going to annex a property, we want to stay within the same philosophy of of still trying to infill as much as possible, and therefore any right. any properties that we annex, we should be trying to go for mixed use, higher density. Again, not high density, but higher density. So I, I, I think it's worded correctly. Is my personal opinion. I just wondered what everybody, if anybody else had, had seen that. Um, um, then I have another one on page forty-six. Three point one point six. So again, I'm not exactly sure what the sub current subdivision design standards are, but um, would also like to have some wording to include building design in keeping with the historical character of the city. Sorry, what number is this, Stacey? Um, it is under, it's on page 46 and it's on 3.1.6. Would you put another strategy in here, Stacy? I'm not exactly sure. So uh, again, this may not be the right place for it, but because you're talking about design standards of the city public works, and I am interested in having some building design review put in our process somewhere. So I'm not sure if this is the right place, but it's because it was talking about design, that's why I put it there. And because we are trying to keep the character of the community and I don't know, you can't just say the historical downtown area, but you know, trying to keep that perspective so that we don't have a contemporary building just because it meets the subdivision rules of um, yeah it's got all the water and sewer and everything. I'd argue we can have that covered already in that you know again before we we would have to annex it before we subdivide before we made it into a subdivision and so then it would have to go through our city subdivision standards and those will be the same with whether you're in the ETJ or whether you're in city limits. Um, we're not going to have two separate sets of code. So I'd argue it's not necessary to spell out uniquely in the ETJ. So it just could be something that, may, we, that I address in that we make sure is in the city policy somewhere. Well, and also later chapters, we do talk about historical yeah. 
preservation right. and things like that. Right. So I think I think that kind of overarching that kind of overarching vision covers anything that we would annex into the property or annex into the city. And okay. Madam Chair, if I may speak, um, and certainly I'd welcome Matthew to confirm this, but I mean, this this is pertaining to city infrastructure. So we're talking water, sewer, stormwater, streets, okay. uh, garbage, where I think Stacy is more talking about building design standards and mm -hmm. facades and right. things that would be probably covered in another chapter. Okay. Just checking. Um, same, same with another clarification I have on page. It's the last page. Aren't you glad it's the last page? Um, 49, I guess. When it says 5.5.1 explore the expansion of broadband utilities to the ETJ. What, what is encompassed in broadband utilities? Simply referring to internet, uh, internet infrastructure. Uh, so broadband internet. So does that include the building of cell phone towers? Not typically. Probably not at this point in time. Um, generally, 4G, 5G aren't considered broadband. So is this a city issue or is this a ETJ issue? Because as we know now from all of our remote access, which we're on tonight, um, you do require cell phone towers and bands of 5G requires um, cell phone towers plus underground. So we probably need to have in there somewhere um, the mention of, of cell phone towers, whether it's in the growth policy itself or whether it's in the ETJ growth policy. I, I don't think that's necessary. What we're asking here is for the developer to ensure that there's connectivity to these neighborhoods to the best of their extent. Now, in a lot of cases, that's going to be expanding, you know, cable out there, fiber optic cable. Um, I don't, I don't see anything as far as dictating cellular service. Again, that's something that's really driven by the commercial carriers. And I'm in that world, so that's why I know that, so. It also drives um, the economy because if you have broader uh, broadband or, or more internet capabilities, then you can pursue other types of businesses. Isn't that true? Yeah, but the market's going to demand it. So Verizon isn't going to, or T-Mobile is not going to put in another tower unless they feel that it'll pay for itself. It's, it's nothing that a developer is necessarily okay. going to have any ability to dictate. It's, it's, it's looking at more of working probably with uh, inter local internet providers like Comcast, realizing that a lot of people are probably going to want cable TV and, and working it at that. But Okay, I just thought we should be aware of that. So, um, double check. Does anybody else have any comments on the ETJ? Stacy, oh. are you close to? Do you have anything else? Well, uh, I have one other. Okay. Where are we going to discuss um, the wind? So on page 24, way back at the beginning, under climate, if this is one place to look at it, um, 
it occurs to me that some of the development um, of different places in the ETJ, for instance, the Harvard Flats, which are now considered open space, so maybe this is a moot point. But nowhere does it indicate in, in here say that, you know, as part of the description of this area that we have significant. Do you have a statement you'd like to add? Or what that statement would look like or sound like? It's windy here. Well, it's don't move here. here. It's wicked windy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. At uh, 9.15, it's windy here. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, yes, I would like to have in the, in the climate section a sentence that says that uh, within the ETJ, there is a, it is noted that there are significant winds and wind gusts that occur, which creates the traffic to be diverted through town. Just a note, we do cover it on page 34 of the growth policy proper, um, which does say the region experiences high winds, especially in winter months, and has a high evapotranspiration rate. Okay. Could you cut and Perfect. paste that into this section, Stacy? Would that make you feel better if it was in both? Or... Uh, I don't think I don't what I don't think we should repeat that much. I mean, I just we can if it'll make if it'll sleep better at night, but. I mean, one thing that I've, I'm, and I'm laying the foundation for the conversations that's going to happen about infill. You know, we, we all are encouraging infill, but we don't have to put infill 300 times in this document. So I think right. if it says it, I think it's good enough. Well, and we did change the designation um, of the ETJ for the area that I was thinking about, which is the Harvard Flats up on the top. So I think that that may have kind of resolved that, so, okay. Okay, anything else, Stacy? I have to look. <laughs> Two Sarah seconds. for chapter one, everybody else. <laughs> no, that's all I have. Okay, thank you so much, Stacy. Good, good thorough comments. Okay, um, we are going to move on to a different section of the agenda. It is 9.15 and our last break was at 7.15. Do we need a five minute break? Uh, just a point of order, I guess. How late are we looking to go this evening? I mean, that's I would, going, you, yeah, going I quite hear a while. Ryan. Why don't we see how we do on chapter one? Let's just give it a let's just give it a go is my uh, suggestion so we don't fall too far behind because we only had one public comment uh, written public comment on chapter one and um, if we can knock at least this out or and maybe we could feel really good about that. Are we okay with that team? Uh, at some point we've got to draw the line and in, in four hours has typically been. A productive meeting. I so that's just my vote, but I, I I'd like to be able to do some personal things after nine thirty to get ready for tomorrow. Do you want to spend fifteen minutes on chapter one, and then call it at nine thirty? That's what I would like to do. But again, I'm just one person. But I'm I'm, I, I'm willing to. I agree. Is that something we have to vote on, Matthew, or can we just go for it? You didn't have a set end time, so uh, you can just go for it and then make a motion to adjourn when you all would like to adjourn. Okay, let's give it 15 minutes for chapter one if we're all in agreement. Do we need to do public comment on chapter one? We do, yep. So just really quickly, is there any, you know, uh, Matthew, you want to give your quick intro on chapter one? Yeah, very quickly. Um, 
The only change for chapter one is that we added a theming paragraph after, based on public comment. Um, this is probably more of a discussion for chapter two about the data. I don't know how much data there is in chapter one. So let me just scroll through quickly. Um, um, there's no data in there. So I will, I will hold the data discussion. Okay. Um, so we will uh, open it up to public comment on chapter one uh, and chapter one only. Um, you have three minutes. And if you have a comment on chapter one, go ahead and raise your hand. Jonathan Hedegger, please state your name and your address and your comment. Yeah, jo uh, Jonathan Hedinger, 519 West Park Street um, in Livingston. Um, I just wanted to make a comment on just chapter one in general. I think um, I think that we're spending a lot of time trying to get this document right and do a good job. And I really and like I think chapter one is um, pretty poorly written um, and just like really kind of lacking. I mean, it really feels like like just the acknowledgement uh, in the beginning about um, the people that have lived here for a, people have lived here for a long time, things like that. I really feel like it needs like a heavy lift and rewrite because um, this document, it, I mean, we're spending so, so much time and so many hours trying to get it right. And um, it's frankly just kind of like, um, I don't know, it's just kind of like wish we could do more on just um, telling the story and everything, um, Livingston and why we like it and things like that. And so, um, and I don't know, actually, I'm looking at it now. Was it changed fairly significantly since um, the draft document, Matthew? Very minimal changes, just the one I mentioned earlier. Okay. Then, yeah, I just think um, overall, it just seemed like it needed kind of a rewrite and just kind of a better, it just didn't really capture the community very well. So I just think there's a lot there and I think it's gonna require more time than 10 minutes this evening, thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Is there any other, Michelle, do you have a, your hand up? And you're on mute. Hi, sorry, just moving my fireplace to my desk here. Thank you all for sticking with us. I'll be really quick. I agree with Jonathan. I think that the introductory chapter is such an opportunity to set the stage for our community. Um, and so I, I would really encourage a bit more uh, storytelling there about the history of our community and the values that you've heard in the comments. Um, so I think that it might be worthwhile just taking a, uh, uh, investing in a creative rewrite to make sure that that is a visionary document and it's going to be the first thing people read and how does that set the stage for the rest of the growth policy and, and talking about the history and our values and this place. Um, I, I, I do think it falls pretty flat right now and uh, I think there's a lot of room for improvement there. So, um, you know, I, I, it's you guys have spent so much time and I'm so grateful, you know, that maybe we can spend the next 10 minutes uh, diving into what we could do to make that better and, and then hash that out at the next meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Anybody this else is, have their hand up? This is Daniela. <clears throat> I just wanted to second Jonathan and Michelle on that. Okay, thanks, Daniela. Uh, Sarah. Yeah, just a quick comment. Um, Sarah stands two and seven South East Street. And um, I think I did a just a it's just it's just my modus operandi to do a quick find and search for the words bike and walk in the document and it in this agenda in this packet it only came up once with the addition of Matthew's um, paragraph on the sense of community when they speak about the commercial development in the downtown. And you'll probably hear me be a bit redundant as we move through these chapters. And I know where a lot of the stuff is supposed to focus within transportation, um, but within even the A, 
GT, um, and, and I know we're not going back there, but chapter one and chapter two, it, there's just a real lack of how people move around our town, how they get to and from their housing, um, how that affects their economics. I mean, like it can, how, how we access even the historical character of our town is, um, is based around how we move through it. So it's a piece for me that's, um, it's a piece for me that's lacking in the narrative and really setting the scene. So if we're talking about the introduction, specifically that sense of character and our assets, um, there's a lot that can be said about walking, biking, rolling, sidewalks, look, feel, just the real essence of it all. That's all I got for now. Thank you. Thank you. Patricia, I see your uh, hand up for public comment. Thank you. Um, can, I'm going to underscore the previous comments as well. Um, you know, I've got family has been here since 1885, and I just don't see the kinds of details and specifics and accurate specifics that ought to be in a document like this. I know this was done by people someplace else, Whitefish or wherever, but I think we need, I, I just think it's, it really needs to be rewritten. Thanks. Thanks, Patricia. Anybody else for public comment on the chapter one? No, I'm sorry. That's okay. Second call for public comment. Are you only allowed to make one? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. But written comment is always welcome. Uh, third call for public comment on chapter one. Seeing none, public comment is closed on chapter one. Um, okay, board discussion. Who would like to go first? Tori. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think that there should be a section on Native American history in the introduction. Um, there is a, a phrase in the opening paragraph, and that's the only acknowledgement that there were people in Livingston before white settlers. And I think that that um, is an egregious mistake. Um, and I, I think that an entire section in the introduction should be dedicated to the significance of that history. Thank you. Um, I just might want to really quickly note that in the memo, Matthew did refer to this executive summary that that he was planning, he or somebody was planning to write at some point to try and capture the essence of this. I may suggest that we might consider instead of an executive summary, we really do bulk up this introduction section uh, in lieu of an, an executive summary and we capture the public comment that has come to us both written on this and now verbal in our meeting tonight. Uh, in addition, it elaborates more on the themes that we know are important to our community. Um, so that's just a, a pitch that instead of an executive summary, we actually bulk up this intro section based on public comment and the themes so that we are really um, capturing the essence of Livingston, which we have heard has been lacking in this document. And I don't know who the best person to do that, if it would be you, Matthew, or if it's something we would seek uh, outside of the city, or, or if that's even something we want to consider. Uh, if we are going to consider it, I'm going to need a lot more specific detail mm -hmm. than uh, a summary based on public comment. We did add some theming um, from what we've heard, but I specifically when we're talking about general things like this, uh, I definitely need specifics and some, some real detail in there. Mm -hmm. So if um, we I, put, so, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was well, just going to say, if I, we put I, that I, ask out, I think we have some very uh, good historians and we've had a lot of good public comment. If that ask goes out, is that appropriate enough to get some, is that scaring you? I can see that that might be scary. Yeah, there, I'm going to need it from um, you guys at this point. Okay. Um, you know, there is a, um, in the 2005 growth policy, there is a history of uh, Livingston 
that I think might, Matthew, you might be able to pull from there uh, several paragraphs that would may be uh, what would, would uh, lend itself to what we're talking about. Check it out, or I have a copy too if you need me. Great, that's a great suggestion, Stacy. thank you. Um, does anybody, have, what are some other comments from the board on this? This is Brian, just in general, I, I don't think the introduction is that bad. Um, I do think it, um, I think, I think it did capture the essence of definitely the public comments received prior to this evening, either written or verbally done. Uh, it definitely captures uh, those things that we really wanted to capture regarding uh, infill, uh, protection of the natural resources. Um, I'm not sure the growth policy is intended to be a, I, I don't know if we really need to reflect too much on the history of Livingston. Now, granted, I know that's important to us, but this doesn't need to be a historical document either. Um, so I don't want to, I don't want to turn it into a five page history lesson. I mean, if you want that, there's other documents for that. So I think we need to capture in a paragraph or so that essence of, of the history, the history and how that binds us to the land. But I don't think we need to overdo it either. So I, I'm personally okay with the introduction as is. Um, however, you know, if there's some, uh, if there's some improvements we can make to make it, you know, better to capture your attention up front, I I'm all for that. But, uh, but that's a heavy lift at this point. And, and I agree, we can't just make it a writing contest for the community and to submit a hundred different inputs. So what I would recommend is, yeah, we take what's what was in the 2005 growth policy. Um, add that historical context and call it good. I would echo Brian's comments because um, I agree for me, you know, I think it's that question of what is the purpose of this introduction, introductory chapter. Um, for me, it was kind of what is the, what is a growth policy and what was the process that got us um, to this, to this product. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm conflicted about adding too much into it because I, do think we should reflect on what the purpose of it is. Okay. And then what are we thinking about this, the executive summary that Matthew is planning to put together? And Matthew, maybe you want to speak to this because it, it's something that you wrote in your memo. Um, we'll do one regardless, just because it's a pretty standard thing that you have in all the documents, just to make sure that uh, people don't have to read into the document. They can just look at the executive summary if that's what they want to do. Um, if you want to make a motion to add specific things to the introduction, uh, you should do that. Otherwise, um, without any sort of specific direction, I'm not quite sure what you want from us. Mm -hmm. okay. Do we do we even know exactly what we want in the executive summary at this point? So isn't it a little bit early to really be guiding you, it seems? I think it's we a little early. Talk about it or provide you a draft towards the end of this process to make sure that it, it covers what you want it to cover. Yeah, the executive summary shouldn't say anything that the growth policy does not say. I mean, it's, right. it's, it, that's right. not the intent. It's it's to take the key elements out of that. So so um, it so we need to figure out what the growth policy is going to say first, and then the executive summary will kind of write itself. Right. So, so maybe what I'm hearing is we could uh, um, make a motion to add the historical content from the 2005 growth policy to this introduction. Um, and then once that is done, we can revisit what that looks like. I'm gonna make a motion to add the 2005 historical content from the 2005 growth policy to the introduction uh, for um, to review again once it's in there. Can I make an amendment to that motion or at what point do I make an amendment to that motion? Uh, You're gonna have to wait for the second first and then you can make an amendment. I'll second the motion. Uh, I would like to put forward an amendment to that motion that uh, mandates inclusion of uh, Native American history within that 
that history that comes from the 2005 growth policy. Okay. Any more discussion on that? Hearing none, we're going to vote. Taya? Four. Tori? Four. Shannon? Four. Brian? Four. Stacy? Four. And Jesse is four. Okay, motion passes. Any other discussion points on chapter one? I have a very minor one. Okay, go ahead, Tori, and then Taya, you're after. Go, go ahead. Uh, the, the word cloud, it's figure 2.5. Uh, I think it's busy and not particularly helpful. Um, I, would, I would replace it with a histogram. Okay. Word cloud is in chapter two. Can we stick with chapter one yeah. for now? We're just on chapter one. My mistake, I apologize. Mental note for next time. <laughs> Taya, go ahead. Oh, uh, I think, I believe figure 1.1, 1 .1, uh, the date, it ends on January, 2020. Um, I just think it needs updating. Uh, figure 1.1. 1 .1. It goes. Oh, we go back in time. So this is the planning process and schedule. So they are, they're just showing the history of the planning process. So would you add to this or, or you no, mean you would? It just needs to be edited. To say, it, so when we're done, it would say April? Yes. So right now it says January, 2020. I think it should be 2021. I don't know if, right. yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, April 2021. Yeah. I think that one got corrected um, and somewhere I've seen it corrected, but <laughs> there's a couple of those in um, the ETJ as well that I didn't bring up that are referencing anytime it's 2020 and instead of 2021. Do we need to make a motion on that or is that a done? That's done. I'll make sure we'll go through towards the end of this process okay. and make all the date and corrections and typos and all that. So uh, you don't need to make a motion on that. We'll okay. make sure that's correct. Perfect. Thank I you. Have, go ahead. I have just another one. I don't know if it falls into that same category on page four on the where you the city had um, rewritten the goals. And underneath the two boxes that say community assets. So on under, I guess, right underneath there. On the last line, it says, these themes can be found throughout the document in a variety of goals, objectives, and strategies, but are summarized here to capture the broad policy themes that should, and it needs to have the word be, <laughs> be reflected in there. And on the one, two, three, Third bullet item down, um, it says um, four important services to be within walking distance and it says or and it should be of. Good catch. Any other comments on chapter one? Okay, do we need to do anything else like, like accept the city's changes to chapter one or anything like that? Uh, that you wouldn't did. be the worst idea just to have a motion uh, to accept that one change. The, the uh, themes that you added? Yeah, basically what's on the screen right now. Okay. I make the motion to accept the changes made to the document as shown. Do we have a second? I'll, I'll second. second it. Tori, maybe. Okay, uh, any discussion? Perfect, let's vote. Taya? Four. Tori? Four. Stacy? Four. Shannon? Yes. Brian? Four. Okay, and Jesse's four. Okay, motion passes. Um, okay, I think we should make, do, I think we should make a motion to adjourn. So I will. Make a motion to adjourn. We will be following up. We'll have to move chapter two. Do I have to make a motion to change? Okay, chapter two is going to be
addressed in our February 17th meeting. We'll start with chapter two on the agenda. And um, I also want you all to know that in the memo, there were many changes that were made that we have, have not seen reflected in the current draft. So Matthew did mention at the beginning of this that he just received those changes. So you will see the changes uh, that we worked on in the January 20th meeting by the next meeting. Is that correct, Matthew? Go ahead. Can I just add something and I'll take like 30 seconds. Yep. Uh, the consultant has been hired for the Trails and Active Transportation Plan. We're gonna form a steering committee for that. We would like a planning board member to be on that steering committee. Uh, so I'm hoping that you all will think about and we'll hold a vote at the next meeting on which planning board member you would like to be on that steering committee. And that's all I have. Perfect. Okay, I make a motion to adjourn. By my clock, it is 9.38 p.m. Do I need a second? Second. Do I need a second? Oh, Second. thank you for <laughs> Bye. 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 And then everybody eyes. Okay. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Way, everybody. way to go. And thanks to the public for thank sticking you, Jesse. out. Thank you, Jesse. You got it. All right. We'll see everybody in a couple weeks. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.